Hi, good morning, for, for real this time. We're, we're all ready to begin if you'd like to take your seats. We have fixed, fixed all of our audiovisual problems, so we can stream in Douglas Terry from JSC. My name is Erica Rogers. I lead our s and partnership activities here at NASA. And we're going to begin today with a formal welcome from NASA's chief technologist, Dr. Douglas Terrier, live via video from Johnson Space Center. Douglas. Good morning, everyone. This is Douglas Terrier coming to you from Johnson Space Center. Let me uh, give a warm welcome to everybody in attendance and thank you all very much for taking the time to join us. This is a very important effort and we really appreciate, particularly our industry partners, um, taking time. We're looking forward to have your input today. I'll just say a few words to get us started. Um, first of all, I'll remind you that my role here at, um, at NASA, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be in the room with you today, but I will join you tomorrow. My role is really to advise the administrator on our technology strategy and to provide input on our, our investment portfolio going forward. Um, I'd like to recognize a couple people before I begin. First in the room, you'll see uh, by, of course, Erica Rogers just at the podium. She'll be leading us today, and she leads our in-space assembly and our partnership efforts with our colleagues at the DOD and Intel community. Uh, David Steets, my deputy, is also in the room today. And also, I want to recognize my colleague, uh, Dr. Byron Knight, the NRO chief scientist, who uh, is, I think, with us today, as well as Dr. Joel Mosier from Air Force Space Command. I think uh, Dr. Michelle Goudreau is joining us today representing Air Force Space Command. So again, thank you all very much for attending today. Um, I look forward to a very productive day of conversation. Again, we are here today primarily to get the opportunity to hear your input from the industry perspective. So um, I know Michelle is going to go a little bit more into the partnership uh, background, but let me just give you a little bit of uh, perspective on where we've been. So the, um, the SND partnership, I think most people in the audience hopefully are familiar with this, but we have been in this effort now for uh, several years, a collaborative effort with the primary uh, partners being the NASA, Air Force Space Command and the National Reconnaissance Office, but we have it up to 20 different federal agencies participating in one way or another in our collaborative technology partnership. Um, the basic goal of this partnership is really to identify synergistic development needs that are common across the partners on the, on the government side and to develop potential collaborative approaches um, for, for development going forward. We're looking to collaborate in ways that leverage the synergy between our, our individual agency needs and really provide for common development approaches as we look ahead. The team started, as I said, about, about three or four years ago, and we initially put our, our, init our, our individual prioritized technology needs on the table, looked for that intersection where we had common areas, and we identified 16 particular areas where we wanted to focus our efforts in the coming years. We started off with a, a, a set of four that we've worked pretty hard over the last year or two. Um, the initial areas being small satellite technology, big data analysis, in-space assembly, and cybersecurity and cyber resilience. Um, NASA is proud to uh, have taken lead on two of those topics, um, and uh, one of which, of course, is the in-space assembly. Now, before I go further, I want to really emphasize how important this area is to us and, in fact, to the government community generally. You may um, all be aware that we are very much focused with directives from the incoming, with the, with the administration directives on uh, focusing our return of development, humans to the moon, for development in a sustainable way of the lunar vicinity for, with the, with the partnership with commercial and international partners as well, as well as work with other government agencies. Along with that, a very big development that's driving a lot of our efforts, of course, is the reconstitution um, of the Space Council, which gives overarching policy direction to NASA as well as the other federal government agencies involved in space in, in how we're pursuing the policies in our space exploration activities. The Space Council has issued so far three directives. The first focuses again on returning humans to the moon for a sustainable effort to develop the lunar vicinity with international and commercial partnership. The second focuses on reducing the regulatory barriers for access to space, 
particularly for commercial companies and private sector endeavors, as well as government endeavors. And the third is really focused on space traffic management. Um, if you take all of those together, you can definitely uh, see the overarching trend or theme in that, which is to promote the development of cislunar space, space in general, as a new frontier. And the focus is on American leadership economically and in the security sense in that region. When we look at the technologies that are going to enable us to, to do on this NASA side and indeed across the government, when we look at the technologies that are going to really facilitate our success in that endeavor, there's just a handful of things that, that we all can name that really can change the game, if you will, that can transform the cost and ease of access to space and, and our ability to perform those missions in space. Among that very short list is in-space assembly, which really offers a, a new way of doing space missions and, in fact, of architecting our space exploration activities. Our in-space assembly team on the interagency side has worked so, over the last few years to define the value proposition from the point of view of each agency, depending on their particular missions, to perform capability analysis, to look at demonstration platform assessments, and to form recommendations for partnering among the agencies to pursue those technologies going forward. We, are, we, we after about a year of uh, very intense work um, with three or four TIMs among the agency on the government side, among the agencies, we're coming to the end of that process now. And this is a very important step that we want to do before we uh, formulate our recommendations. Then that is to get um, as, the, as broad a possible perspective from the industry side on, on what your view on in-space assembly and the technologies that you're working on the industry side, so we can incorporate that in our recommendations as we formulate um, approaches for uh, demonstrations and implementations going forward. So let me just make sure we, we set the tone right. Um, I think everyone should be aware, but I, I just want to be clear that uh, we're not in the mode today of a typical um, industry day where we're going to make announcements about solicitations or, or specific funding vehicles. Rather, again, we're focused on sharing the work that our team's completed so far on the government side in in-space assembly and, and learning from you so that we can incorporate your perspectives from the commercial sector as we go forward. We'll begin this morning by sharing information on the S&T partnership in general, some background on this, um, on the in-space assembly activities that have uh, been completed so far with the government agencies and on our integrated analysis and our, and our initial formulation of potential uh, approaches going forward. It's going to be a very open forum. We want to engage in dialogue with the commercial companies today to learn about your investments in in-space related technologies, capabilities, systems, and how those systems and developments relate to the capability needs of the government space agencies within our S&T partnerships. This afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to do, um, for the participants to meet with the S&T government panel to discuss your vision for in-space assembly and plans to infuse in space assembly technologies into your, how it fits into your business line and how it relates to government needs on, on our side. So again, I look forward to a very productive day. I thank um, all of our participants for sharing your time and your willingness to, to share your perspectives. As I said, this is really vital to us um, being able to formulate a, an approach that's representative of both the government perspective as well as the capabilities and perspectives from the industry side. I will be, um, again, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but we have ample representation from the government team. Um, I will be there coming in this evening to hear the results from today, and I look forward to hearing um, the results of your, your discussions today. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Thanks, Douglas. I'd like to ask all of our ST partnership team members to stand and be recognized. Our team members are uh, multidisciplined and represent the Air Force, the Naval Research Lab, NASA, and the NRO. Members of our S&T team will be presenting information this morning and will also be on our government panel this afternoon during our one-on-one -on -one sessions. Thank you all for your continued support. I'd also like to highlight three students that are working on our team. Joe Fulton, who's studying aerospace engineering at the University of Maryland. Nick Houghton, studying mechanical engineering at Michigan State University, and Alex Mazar, studying aerospace engineering at Virginia Tech. So please introduce yourselves to our students and share with them your expertise within the aerospace community. 
NASA's Chief Technologist Office has an excellent visual communications and outreach specialist, Tiffany Long. Today's event is well-planned and well-orchestrated because of Tiffany's expertise. Thank you, Tiffany. And a big thank you to Will Bryan, OCT's website coordinator, for helping us get out and communicate information outside of, the, outside of our agency. We're live streaming today's event. The link is listed in your program. The event is also being recorded and will be made available on our OCT website after the event. Microphones are placed around the room for questions, and we ask that you use the microphone so that the audio is captured um, through the live stream and the recording. Please follow along this morning in your program. Speaker bios and the agenda are published there. And then we're going to begin now with our next speaker, Dr. Michelle Goudreau, the Technical Director in the Office of the Chief, or the Chief Scientist at Air Force Space Command. So good morning. Oh, yeah, you got it. I'm all checked out on this technology now. All right, so here's the, the slide that talks a little bit about the background. It was established in 2015. Um, I have to, I can't, okay. So there's accomplishments, basically, yeah, 10 technical exchange meetings today. You know, we've crosswalked different uh, roadmaps in each area, transformed the government, and we've, topic one has actually been transferred to NRO's uh, government forum on CubeSat, so we're, that's the one that we've successfully completed. There's the four to uh, topic areas that Mr. Terrier uh, mentioned. And then our next steps, right, to, so the next one, right, is the in-face assembly, which we're doing right today. Uh, and then we'll be delivering the recommendations that come out of this forum uh, to the agencies in, you know, later this fall. We have a big data research workshop coming up, sponsored by NRO in March, and looking forward to looking at cislunar. And for those of you who aren't quite sure what cislunar means, it's basically anything between here and the moon in that neighborhood. So a couple of examples of our recent tech, uh, activities, five interchange meetings in 2018, uh, monthly space pillar meetings at the Pentagon, and inter interagency white papers. So tech, some of our key tech transitions have been the cyber defense strategy for NASA's uh, restore land scan missions. And then, of course, today's briefing to you guys is, is our one that we're focusing on right now. Some future efforts, uh, assessment of the ISS, space test range, which I think we'll be hearing more about later, and ID, uh, some S&T gaps for the CIS lunar space domain. So we're really working on that, and the Air Force specifically is working hard on that one. So here's an overview of uh, topic one. So again, its goal was to develop miniaturized sensing capabilities for CubeSats and small sat platforms. That's a list of our various uh, accomplishments, and of course our current status is we've transitioned it. Right. Big data analysis is, is hard at work. Goal there is to integrate advances in cognitive mod modeling with automated data analysis to create game-changing effects. And our steps are we just finished uh, a big data analysis solutions forum uh, last month and looking forward to the big data research workshop. And there's some other information on that too. Hmm. Topic three is the one where it's all near and dear to our hearts in this room, right? Developing the capability to perform autonomous or semi-autonomous in-space assembly of space systems. There's a picture of, of the team at their last um, meeting that they had. So basically, that's that's the overview of the uh, of the in-space assembly, or I mean, of the ST Partnership Forum. So we have time for questions, or does anybody have any questions, or we want to get into the meet of today? All right, let's go ahead, let's do some good work. Next up, we'll be having our NASA presentation on assembly in space uh, with Dr. Keith Belvin and Dr. Harley Thronson. One of these does something, huh? Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to share with you some of the work that's uh, been done 
And the context that I want to talk this morning, the first 15 minutes, and then I'll turn it over to Harley Thronson for the last 15 minutes, is um, why we think in space assembly is kind of a game changer for us. Uh, if you look at uh, NASA's 60 year history, uh, the only exception to the fact that we've launched every spacecraft in a single vehicle is the International Space Station. So, of course, there's some assembly required w for the space station. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, Space Station uh, had about 40 flights to assemble all the pieces together uh, from uh, 1998 to 2011. Of course, we've had continued uh, presence on the Space Station uh, since 2000, so for about 18 years now we've had uh, continual presence in space. But if you look at uh, the station and, and the number of parts put together, there, there was actually a dedicated vehicle called the Space Shuttle <laughs> that uh, was primarily designed to, to assemble the Space Station. Uh, over all those many flights. We look at the, the example we have of in-space assembly and you could think, well, it's quite an expensive endeavor. Uh, the total shuttle program was about $200 billion and the, the ISS program was about $120 billion um, uh, putting all the pieces together. So that's a very expensive endeavor. So we typically haven't used that uh, routinely, uh, doing in-space assembly of uh, space systems. Uh, but we think now is the time is right, and I'll talk a little bit about why and, and the kind of attributes that we think in-space assembly can lead to future space systems, not just large, um, you, you know, crewed space systems like the station, but also for scientific satellites, and uh, Harley will talk about some science applications of in-space assembly. Uh, to me, there are two real game changers in the space paradigm. One is small spacecraft, and we know all the advances being made currently with uh, everything from CubeSats to ESPA class uh, small spacecraft. Uh, we can get very high uh, spatial uh, coverage and temporal coverage with lots of satellites uh, for a fairly low cost. And, and so that really is an important change to the way that we build space systems. The other one is the one we're talking about today, uh, in-space assembly, and you'll find that you really can't separate that from servicing and manufacturing also. So we're talking a little bit about all three, but the focus of the, the topic today is in-space assembly. So let's think about that uh, a little bit. Think about the current paradigm. Um, let's take JWST, and this is a chart I received from Nick Siegler at JPL. I, I like the way you put it together. Um, JWST was uh, designed based on the 1990 decadal plan, and uh, yeah, the, the science uh, goals were very clear. Uh, six and a half meter telescope, segmented telescope, uh, infrared, cooled, uh, so the large sunshade. But well, we take that beautiful telescope and design, and then we have to fold it up, right, <laughs> to fit it in the launch vehicle. And in this case, it's an Arian 5, I believe. Um, not only do we have to, you know, fold it and package it, uh, we have to hold it in place during launch uh, because the, the launch vibrations, the, the, the environment that we launch the system in, is quite uh, demanding. And so we have to go through round tests to uh, uh, shake and bake, if you will, uh, the package system to verify that, that everything's going to operate. And we know we've had a few problems with that. Uh, the key thing, though, is the volume and mass constraints that that fairing and launch vehicle place on the system. Uh, it really is uh, a, a true constraint. Of course, what we want to do is to go operated in its uh, design state, and so we have to deploy the system. Uh, if you look at JWST, um, it's cost quite a bit of money, and it's cost quite a bit of time. We, we focus a lot on time uh, as dollars being the critical resource, but uh, I want the, the idea to come across today that uh, time is a critical resource too. Uh, for, amongst the government agencies, we want to have a faster response time. Um, if you think about JWST, it's got 40 deployable structures, uh, 178 release mechanisms, uh, and all that has to, to work autonomously, deployed uh, in L2. So uh, the question is, is there another approach? Is there another way to do this that's uh, maybe faster, maybe less costly? Uh, we'll think about that. And so the, the concept that I'm trying to use today is based on some work actually done by uh, the Army Engineering Center. Um, and it's this idea of engineering for resilience. Uh, moving away from this 20th, 20th century systems engineering approach of very custom build uh, approach to a, a 21st century approach, which is more uh, open architectures. So going to composability and integration. Another way to say this is 
Do you think of what we've done in the past? It's been very fixed and focused, uh, highly specialized platforms, uh, fixed capabilities, and, and fairly costly. And if the mission changes, they don't adapt very readily. So we're trying to move towards a more modular, adaptable, autonomous approach where the platforms are flexible. We can uh, be adaptable to uh, upgrades in technology and capabilities. And hopefully, the life cycle cost will be more affordable than the way that we've done it in the past. So what kind of attributes are we trying to achieve you know, by using in-space assembly? Well, certainly, as we've already pointed out, to break the current launch constraints. We want to have increased performance and, and uh, new capabilities. You know, we don't have to design spacecraft the way we've always designed them, uh, because if we can assemble them in space, they can look very different than the way we've, we've built them in the past. Resilience, we want to be able to, to adapt to mission change. We know deep space architectures will require us to uh, uh, change the mission based on what we find. Uh, so as we learn, we want to uh, pursue those new knowledge that we have. We want to be able to evolve the systems, not to go to a, a single mission use and throw the vehicle away or platform away. We'd like to be able to evolve it to another use. Uh, this idea of Earth independence, you know, we've spent the past uh, 20 years or more in low Earth orbit where getting access to, from Earth to, to LEO is pretty straightforward. Uh, but in deep space, that's a much more challenging problem. So Earth independence is important. And of course, the ability to change out modules um, either due to repair or upgrade is, is really uh, nice. Uh, we think lower life cycle cost will come about by reusability and, and making these multi-mission systems. Uh, we think we can increase the cadence of, of those uh, missions by making them lower cost. And of course, um, the ground assembly integration test. Uh, we build very large facilities to do AI&T on the ground in simulated environments. We're always operating in gravity. We simulate the thermal environments and vacuum environments. Um, if we did that in space, we don't have to have all of those facilities on the ground. And of course, as I've talked about before, faster response time. A lot of the systems that we fly on spacecraft are, are 15 to 20 years old by the time they launch. And the mission is 15 to 20 years. You're flying 40-year-old technology, oftentimes on spacecraft. Can we, can we upgrade uh, those systems? And of course, uh, modular reconfiguration is another option that we have uh, to adapt to mission change. So these are some of the attributes that, that come about. And if you were from the, the old era, you might think of this as uh, faster, better, cheaper. Well, we realize that you can't do all three. Uh, but for certain missions, we do want to concentrate on on some of these attributes. So that's what we think we can do. As I pointed out before, what we want to do is to change the way that we uh, design, build, and operate space systems. Uh, not every spacecraft will fall into this, but some of our space systems will. Uh, again, in-space assembly is kind of one tier of a, of a three-legged three stool. In-space servicing is critical, and in-space manufacturing is advancing very rapidly. It will have a huge impact on the space systems as well. Uh, but kind of already pointed out the benefits and the interest of time. I'm not going to uh, reiterate all of these. Uh, as you can read those, uh, we really are looking for uh, larger systems, persistent systems, the ability to do technology upgrade to, to lower that life cycle cost and, uh, and to do things faster than the way that we do them today. And why do we think we can do that? You know, what's happening to make us think that this is possible? A lot of advances in space robotics, um, certainly the uh, the uh, Canada arm on the shuttle as well as on the space station, the dexterous arm on the space station have taught us a lot about what we can do with uh, advanced robotics. We have a couple of missions you'll hear about from the other government partners this morning that will show that uh, these uh, robotics are really advancing. And of course, autonomous operations are, are really important. Um, moving away from uh, strictly tele-robotic operations to more automated systems to, to some level of supervised autonomy. Uh, the commercial sector is providing very low-cost access to space now. And so we could launch multiple uh, launches to aggregate space systems in, in uh, orbit to put them together. And of course, you see some other things on the list there. These are some, some things that I think this is an opportune time to go visit and, and we want to hear from you today about what you, your vision is for assembly uh, of space systems, and including the servicing and manufacturing of those systems. So it, it is a system problem. Uh, it starts with the, the design, um, but assembly and operations are critical. 
everything from the beginning, from rendezvous and docking, to the, the uh, autonomous proximity operations, to uh, the joining technology that one has, to assemble the parts, uh, the mobility and tools for the robotics uh, that, that you're needed, and of course the uh, manufacturing both uh, in space and, and even on the surface as we go to the lunar surface and to Mars. Uh, one of the critical things that we're already uh, facing is uh, the AI and T challenges. You know, currently we try to uh, test the full system on the ground before launch. Uh, the way we're designing uh, in the future using in-space assembly means that you have to do that in space. And so there's some uh, technical challenges uh, associated with how do you use mod sim to, to convince yourself that you can uh, certify and, and fly these systems. Um, and of course, uh, the cultural aspects of, hey, we're not gonna be able to test the full system on the ground. Uh, we have to do that in space. And so how do we do that? So there are some real uh, challenges associated with that. Um, so uh, quickly, uh, and you'll hear more about this today, uh, Hubble's taught us a lot. Uh, Goddard has led uh, activities associated with servicing Hubble. Uh, you might not remember that the solar rays were replaced twice on Hubble uh, to get the pointing stability that we needed. Uh, so the ability to service uh, these platforms and replace uh, key elements is, is critical. Uh, back in the 80s, we actually looked at uh, uh, EVA uh, assembly of structures, uh, trusses, uh, very successful activity leading to uh, uh, the joining technology that was used by astronauts to, to join structures together. Uh, so EVA proved that we could do this in space. Um, we also took it uh, by some members uh, in the room here, and, and by the way, my name's on the charts, but many of the people in the room here uh, participated in doing this work. Um, this is autonomous uh, robotic assembly back in the 90s, early 90s, of a, uh, a truss and some panels on that truss uh, by Bill Doggett that um, uh, shows you that you can use autonomy to assemble structures. Uh, and here we did this on the ground uh, with a, um, a ro fairly simple robotic system uh, and a lazy Susan, if you will. So can we take these things uh, to space and, and use those? Doug already mentioned this morning that our focus uh, in the near term is on uh, cislunar space, cislunar operations. Uh, you'll see Mars is not uh, the immediate target, but certainly the systems that we're developing can be applicable to Mars. And uh, one of the key things that will be built first is the Gateway. Uh, the Gateway is another modular vehicle that's being put together, uh, sort of like the space station, so it's much, much smaller than the space station. If you uh, want to think about using this Gateway as part of your um, uh, infrastructure to do in-space assembly and manufacturing, that is a possibility. Some of the technologies that we'll talk about today might be used to influence the way we design the gateway, but in addition, it can be used to service uh, the lunar assets and infrastructure uh, for refueling, uh, reuse, uh, reconfiguration. Uh, and again, if you looked at the uh, way we plan to put the gateway together, this is uh, kind of the components and launches, both commercial and government launches to, to launch all the parts for that. So we are talking about large systems here, and partly because, um, you know, humans don't scale. <laughs> so we need large uh, systems for human crewed missions. Uh, but we also need some large systems for transit. Uh, if we want to go to uh, deep space or even uh, orbit changes within uh, the cislunar space, large solar electric propulsion vehicles, uh, our uh, Envision 300 to 500 kilowatt vehicles for SCP. Uh, in addition, going to Mars, we wanted to get there quickly, and we're already looking at nuclear thermal propulsion to do that. Uh, but you can think about in-space assembly and, and manufacturing on, on these vehicles as well. So we talk a lot about large systems, uh, but I want to, to make sure that you don't lose sight of the fact that these technologies apply to much smaller systems. So let's take an example. Uh, we have the A train flying now, the, the, uh, the AM train, if you will. Um, uh, a suite of uh, science instruments uh, for Earth, Earth science, remote sensing uh, on five or six different satellites, the flying formation. Uh, they're nearing the end of their lifetime now. So we're thinking about replacing various uh, parts of those. Uh, an approach we could take is to develop a, an Earth science uh, platform, if you will, a, a remote sensing platform where we could uh, just plug and play instruments on that platform. So again, a, a government uh, 
uh, operated system where, uh, I mean, a, a commercial operated system uh, where maybe the government uh, or, and other entities design instruments that, that can be plug and played. You can upgrade those much more uh, quickly than replacing a whole satellite with its suite of instruments. Um, and again, we're always thinking about large systems, but small systems. Uh, already there's work underway with uh, nanosatellites, uh, CubeSat class satellites, uh, doing in-space uh, assembly operations using magnetic docking and so forth to uh, take advantage of what we can do by aggregating systems together and, and uh, using the power of those. So in this case, the, the, each of the CubeSats is a, quote, module of a, a larger system. So. Um, I really think in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing is going to change the way that we design, build, and maintain and operate space systems. Uh, there are some technology gaps you're going to hear about this morning. There's a particular technology taxonomy that will be uh, used in the s and partnership. Uh, but these are some of the things that uh, lead us to think that uh, there's work to be done uh, into uh, developing these capabilities beyond what they exist today. Uh, we'll start off with fairly simple operations and go to much more complex operations over time. Um, in addition to the technology gaps, there are some cultural gaps, though, right? Uh, moving from this custom build to composability and integration, it's a different way of designing space systems. We're not used to doing that. Uh, changing from ground-based uh, system AINT to space-based, uh, that's, a, that's a cultural change for us. Going from single, log, single mission kind of really focused design to a, a, a reusable architecture, a resilient architecture, another barrier for us culturally. And of course, we can get into this risk analysis paralysis where, you know, you know, can we buy down all of the risk to be, and understand all of the uncertainties and, and never do anything? Uh, we, we think we can move faster than that. I'm glad to see some students involved in here today because I think students are going to be critical in, in, in the, making the cultural change as they uh, adapt these technologies. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Harley, who will talk about some experience with uh, uh, space science systems and the surfacing work uh, done at Goddard. And wherever Harley went, there is Dr. Harley Thronson. Thank you, Keith. All right. Let's see. There we go. So Keith gave an excellent introduction, uh, and I, uh, working together, do sort of the wrap up. Keith gave, Keith gave views on what capabilities and technologies, operational schemes, what the advantages are moving forward, and um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of areas that um, NASA ha already has underway, um, both with purely NASA resources and also working with you all. Um, a couple of the co-authors are here, so let me see. Hey, it's, it's easier if I work this. All right, this is what this is basically about is that NASA has had very good success in space assembly, space servicing, both with robots and with humans. And we've had even greater success when we have partnered with academia, with industry, when we have partnered across centers um, with other government institutions and so on. As uh, Keith mentioned, as I'll show you in a couple of the slides. Now, the first slide, the second slide, I believe is, is our ego slide. This is, um, this is patting ourselves on the back, all the wonderful things that NASA has done. Uh, pay attention, however, now I'll go back to this from time to time. Note these various missions. Um, that uh, almost always involve a partner of some kind. And this is the, my very last slide here, we'll show you. Um, we're available uh, to carry out or update or upgrade um, some of the activities I'll be discussing next. The um, 3D printing is already underway, additive manufacturing already underway. Um, our partners down at uh, Langley uh, have been continue. I think it's Billy something like uh, 20 years of development of um, uh, truss structures and assembled um, increasingly high precision structures that may one day be adaptable to big space astronomy missions. And then um, when I close, you see there's this one highlighted area um, uh, down at the end there. Uh, the progress that we have been making lately to do design, undertake, develop design work 
for a possible next generation of very large astronomical observatories. All right, status of current work. Well, Keith already pointed this out, assembling the space station. Something 40 plus assembly flights and about a half a dozen uh, additional flights of uh, uh, demos of, of in-space assembly. Remarkable. Um, the, uh, and, and the tools and the processes that have been developed for this, we believe are directly applicable, applicable but have to be upgraded for the kinds of missions that NASA, with partners, are considering now. Um, some, but not a great deal of high precision assembly here, and that is a direction that we want to continue to, the high, um, high precision assembly is a direction that we definitely want to go into, but loads of terrific lessons learned. Um, at Goddard, again, with partners, um, Goddard is, and the folks who are leading the Restore-L mission um, are here in the audience if you have some detailed questions. Um, this is uh, uh, an activity originally going back to the office at Goddard um, that delivered on uh, the servicing mission for Hubble and over the last several years has turned into a very effective um, office for uh, robotic leading to robotic assembly, robotic servicing. Um, this will be the next, in fact, I think, Ben, this is the next big um, servicing activity, Restore L, I, uh, following on robotic refueling missions, I said, because you in the upper left, born out of the Hubble servicing program. Uh, and what is it, 2020, 2021, Ben? Restore L, 23? 22, I wasn't bracketed a little bit there. Um, the capabilities that Goddard with partners are developing are truly impressive and you all are welcome to come out and visit and discuss this afternoon on possibilities of collaboration. Um, and this, uh, as I note in the, in the um, outline box below, uh, Restore-L has the capability of possibly being an early demonstration of, of not just servicing as depicted in the figures here, but possibly assembly, see how that goes. Um, and the, the capabilities demonstrated by Restore-L or those that may be built upon Restore-L have enormous, um, have enormous uh, uh, application throughout almost all of the topics that we're going to be talking about here. From, again, once again, working with, with partners. Oh, this probably does work. There we go. Isn't that nice? Um, so orbital debris mitigation, on-orbit assembly, uh, with or without humans, uh, observatory servicing, which is, which is uh, a requirement that all of you probably know since 2010, NASA has been required to service. Um, and of course, advanced servicing is almost indistinguishable from space assembly. NASA has been required to build all its large uh, space missions to be serviceable. So the um, Restore-L uh, should be, its goal should be, or goal is to be a milestone, a keystone in further development of space servicing, but of course for the benefit of all of us here, space assembly. Um, uh, NASA and partners um, have been considering uh, space assembly of large optical systems for a number of years. Uh, a little historical note. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which we heard a little bit about, I'll say a little bit more about, NASA's next big space observatory, uh, was proposed in the late 1990s by Boeing to be assembled in space. And Boeing Incorporated produced a very impressive engineering document and scientific justification for assembling uh, a seven-ish uh, maybe the, maybe eight meter ish um, diameter telescope in space, slightly bigger than uh, the James Webb Space Telescope that eventually evolved out of those engineering designs in the late 90s. Um, about five six years ago, a handful of us at the Space Telescope Space Telescope Science Institute, um, Goddard and JPL, uh, conceived of a mission called Optics. I've now forgotten what the acronym stood for, but OP is optical, and I, one of those eyes is, is International Space Station, a demonstration uh, mission um, 
uh, to produce a roughly one and a half meter um, uh, demonstration optic system, a telescope that would be mounted on the space station, assembled robotically on the space station to show that you could, in fact, assemble a precision optical device, a telescope, in space, and in this case, as I said, on the space station. Really a terrific, um, a terrific program. Um, that was the concept on the left, and on the right, you see the piece parts that would be um, launched uh, in launched as a separate unit, um, extracted from, and I, apologies, I don't remember what, what the vehicle was that was going to launch it, um, extracted in parts and over the course of roughly three months would be assembled on the, on the space station. Um, one of the interesting, I was one of the members of the team, one of the interesting aspect, uh, aspects of this is it was also intended to use astronauts um, as a contingency, that uh, we would integrate the robotic assembly, which would be purely robotic if it was fully successful, we're going to integrate the robotic assembly with having astronauts um, uh, available as necessary. So that was an interesting exercise, working with the limited the limitations that um, astronaut EVA has uh, in building a complex, small, but complex optical system. Um, it, uh, it got as far as some very advanced engineering and uh, the cost pro proved to be, at the time, too much for, for NASA. A bit of a pity, but actually um, it was more expensive than we intended in the beginning, so it probably was the right decision. Now, um, uh, uh, Keith mentioned, um, and I just mentioned, the James Webb Space Telescope. Six and a half meters, it's going to be launched by um, an Ariane 5. We open about 18 months from now, roughly speaking. The largest optical system, civilian optical system um, in space. Uh, the, there are, as many of you know, some of you are probably involved in it, there are a handful of, uh, there are four uh, NASA-funded strategic mission concepts that can be proposed in about six months or so to the decadal, National Academy's decadal survey process. One of them is a very impressive, scientifically incredibly powerful uh, UV optical IR mission called the Large UV Optical IR Surveyor Louvoir, um, an impressive mission. Um, two versions, one 15 meters in diameter in round numbers, another eight meters in diameter in round numbers. The 15 uh, meter design for Louvoir folds up and self deploys somewhat similarly to JWSD and is um, uh, designated for the SLS Block II cargo the largest launch vehicle that is currently being conceived of uh, and is intended to be a, a cargo delivery vehicle for human missions to the, to the Martian surface. Don't know what the future of Mars exploration is going to be with humans, uh, so it's chancy there. And 15 meters appears to be the largest aperture that one can launch in the largest conceivable launch vehicle. Ground-based uh, observatories are under construction in the 30 to 50 meter range. What happens uh, when the scientific hunger of astronomers uh, requires apertures larger than 15 meters? You all know the answer, assembly in space. So there's an activity um, led uh, by, um, well, my two colleagues over, over here who will, will be speaking to a number of you during this day, Nick Siegler and Ruda Mukherjee. Uh, uh, based out of the uh, JPL-based Exoplanet Exploration Program Office to look at how would one assemble in space a very large aperture telescope. Astronomers love big aperture telescopes. Um, the model that we're looking at, the concept that we're looking at is a 20-meter diameter off-axis UV optical IR observatory. Um, there are the basic features. Um, that were adopted for this design, a proof of concept design, um, over the past couple of months in a pair of workshops, one at, one at uh, JPL and one hosted by our colleagues at Langley. Um, and uh, sorry, it's a little bit tough to read. This basic design has been already modularized so that our engineers um, can then break up the well, modularized so that they can then optimize them, the modules. Um, and design the robotic systems that would later, in this scheme, assemble the observatory in space. 
Thank you. Um, and this is what it looks like now. Um, charmingly referred to as a Thunderbird because of its shape. Um, all these features here, you saw the, the exploded design previously. All these bronze colored um, items here are um, to protect the, instrumenta the instrumentation from scattered light in a system like this with the, with the um, trusses uh, and the assembly back here. There's a great deal of scattered light. There's instruments in each of these um, uh, five units, um, and our team, their team, has broken up um, this observatory into those, I don't know, Rudra, you'd probably know, about 12 or 15 modularized components that in subsequent, in the work underway now and in subsequent work, will be, quote, unquote, assembled um, in the engineering concept uh, to produce the um, the Thunderbird design on the left, and will be assessed for optimizing the, the or minimizing the number of launch vehicles that are necessary to take that into space. Um, our goal is to produce a final report to uh, NASA in the spring of this coming year, which will be turned into the National Academy's last slide. A list of um, observations and findings that were born out of the Restore-L activity at Goddard, some thoughts that, uh, the, that we have put into this for this in-space assembly activity, the um, design of which I just showed you. Uh, always bear in mind for our colleagues here that NASA priorities for in-space assembly is likely to be dominated by, but not to the exclusion of other actors, but likely, likely to be dominated by um, science goals. Human spaceflight, of course, but assembly uh, for most assembled items um, dominated by science. Um, the technology capabilities need to be prioritized. That's one of the purposes of, of this activity. Thank you, Erica. Um, identify demonstrations in a representative environment. This is a new field. Uh, um, uh, assembly demonstrations are going to be necessary. This is an area where we need to collaborate across institutions and across centers. Um, the relations among and between assembly, servicing, and manufacturing are complex and need, need sophisticated management. Keith referred to this in order to optimize among those three. Uh, the second to the last bullet, uh, not much mentioned. This is going to be an international activity, so norms and standards of behavior need to be agreed upon. And um, down at the bottom, NASA is charged by its charter. It was one of the element, three elements of the founding document of NASA to share the development, the, the design, um, and the operation of our major activities. And if you want to hear more, the two broad areas um, at Goddard and based at JPL are, are looking forward to further conversation with you all. Erica. Thank you, Harley. Uh, next up, Dr. Roberta Ewart, the Chief Scientist, Air Force Space and Missile System Center. First of all, I'd like to thank Erica and her entire uh, NASA team, uh, Sharon, uh, Jeffries, Bill Williams, Dave Arney, and maybe two not present, but um, very important to me, uh, Doris Hamill and Jim Van Lack. Um, my colleague, Elazar Plotke, and I have had the opportunity to outreach to Jim, uh, who is one of the key former chief engineers on the International Space Station. Um, my preference is to utilize previous information readily available so we don't pay again for things that we've already learned. Uh, hence the theme on the shoulders of giants. Those of you who've grown up through the scientific community are well aware of that phrase and where it originates and why it's important. Um, this particular briefing went through a severe public affairs release process. A lot of things have been stripped out. Um, so I'm going to have to fill in quite a bit of the material. 
Um, if you see the term OGA, that's a reference to Byron's organization, but it was required to remove from this particular uh, briefing. I'd also like to thank up front my uh, DARPA colleagues. In the last 15, 20 years, we've had a great ride. I want to thank Owen Brown, Dave Barnhart, Dave Palmer, and Joe Parrish. Uh, Joe uh, was out with us uh, recently in uh, California when we did our Material Innovation Working Group number eight on the advanced space-based testbed known as XST, and Joe's presence made a, a, a great and positive influence on where we see this uh, going. Also want to thank uh, Ben Reed, uh, the work he's been doing incredible on Restore L, and of course Bernie Kelm and the work by NRL over the years has just been tremendous, and I'm hoping the Air Force will take advantage of all the work uh, that you all have done. So uh, you can obviously see where the theme came from on the shoulders of giants. I just named those people and those who came uh, before them. I sit at a USAF product center. I am halfway between a laboratory such as Air Force Research Lab and the major command, and Michelle uh, is representing our major command, uh, Air Force Base Command, and is here for Dr. Joel Mosier. Joel and I have a long relationship, as I've had with all the Air Force Base Command chief scientists, and I'll, I'll call out some interesting things we've learned on our journey. So my product center is going through a huge um, transformation right now. There's a name for it. It's called SMC 2.0. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, so when I get to that chart, I'll breeze through it, but it was kind of a mandatory one they wanted me uh, to discuss with you all because it will touch industry and how we interact with industry, and because of the strong industry presence, um, they wanted me to address that uh, with you all. Um, so that'll be one of the first things I go through. The acronym for SMC 2.0 is EPIC, and you'll hear about that in a moment. And of course the term speed comes from the desire to go faster, and we've heard a couple of those nuances in the previous talks. So uh, I'll make sure I cover some of that. Uh, I will walk you through a concept that was born out of a visit to another NASA location Armstrong Dryden. So I'll walk you through that campfire story. It's kind of fun. I'll talk to you a little bit about MIWIG 8, which is the concurrent concept development activity uh, that's the fourth bullet down there. And then I'll briefly go through uh, a way ahead. So here's the mandatory chart, the motivation for SMC 2.0 EPIC speed. EPIC refers to the first four letters of the four items, enterprise partnership, innovation and culture. Um, though required that we address all of them, in particular due to short time, um, I would like to only focus on, uh, well, focus on one lightly, the partnership one, because without partnership, Erica and I and the whole team wouldn't be here with you all today. So we've definitely been hitting on the partnership activity, but my real love always has been innovation. Since my first uh, tour of duty at NASA Johnson in the early 80s, where I was inspired to space by my NASA colleagues, that has stayed with me my entire life. And uh, again, it's made it very easy for me to in interact with the entire NASA community. Um, we're looking for a balanced portfolio. That means balance with industry. So my colleagues at Lockheed, Raytheon, Boeing, uh, Northrop, GD, Honeywell, and others, um, I'm out there with you all the time listening to your IRAD activities. There will be a drift towards weaving some of the material you will hear here into the um, independent research and development reviews of the major companies. And hopefully that will create a push-pull process that will make it easier for all of us to move along on the in-space assembly, manufacturing, and servicing uh, pipeline. But this balanced portfolio will likely be incremental for several companies due to the, the need to move large companies at a certain pace. But we also want some strategic innovative investments that maybe some of our smaller, more agile companies can do ahead of time. And so that will be worked by me with Small Business Innovation Research and Rapid Innovation Fund which is available to all of you to look at. We, we publish our BAAs regularly so everyone can hear about that. And please do see me at an appropriate time today if you'd like to discuss that further. So big eye on innovation. Oh, and I should probably tell you, I was also named as the Chief Innovation Officer. 
I will not use the acronym CIO because I keep getting email for the Chief Information Officer. I will likely call myself the XIO. I like X, advanced. So XIO will likely be my three-letter uh, designation, and I will be focusing on the uh, innovation um, component. The one at the bottom, so you've got EPIC and then SPEED. Um, October 15th, our three-star, uh, J.T. Thompson, uh, gave an uh, industry and product center briefing on how we were going to change our organization. So I want you all to know we now have four PEOs, four program executive officers whose job it is to speed the decision-making process. This couldn't have come at a better time for an innovator uh, such as myself because now I believe we have a chance to speed our innovation up through the decision chain. So stand by as we roll out these new personnel. This is quite a leap for the product center and those in industry who have known SMC. Um, I think you, you realize this is a big change for us. But that's really where if you take innovation and speed, and I'm now going to start going down the technology readiness level argument, the speed will come when we do the TRL 5 to 7 leap. So the theme of what I'm going to probably do the remainder of this chat with you is to focus on how does one make the TRL 5 to 7 leap go faster and more efficiently with a bigger team that includes industry. So, of course, we, being in the DOD, have certain demands placed on us. Again, this is a very, very cut-back chart from where it stood. Um, but demands by Congress of the space community, um, we've been asked to move more quickly, which is um, kind of obvious, take advantage of commercial capability. So that means we have to establish much better interactive relationships. And I've already revealed to you my strategy which is when it comes to the small businesses, it'll be an increase in small business innovation research and rapid innovation fund activities focused on some of these technologies. And then for my large businesses, I will really be looking at our IRAD portfolio together and what we can do with each unique IRAD portfolio of each of those large companies. I think the approach NASA has shown us when it comes to a modular and more open approach architecting space, will break a cycle of increasing cost. But there will be obvious cost with infrastructure. The business case analysis that we know is coming, and maybe some of you have already started it, will need to be a very important part of our ongoing relationship. We must understand the industry business case, you must understand the Air Force business case, and we must understand uh, NASA's uh, government business case. Another thing we're all going to have to work on, and I'm glad Erica called out her students earlier, we still have to build a smarter, more capable workforce and our operational communities. Uh, that actually breaks down into two parts. At the product center, I can have a little more say about the acquisition workforce. My sense is to really get people excited, they have to do more hands-on things. Analysis is good. Analysis is important. Making the strategy is important. But the young are attracted to hands-on things. That means more testing. So there is a natural thread here where if we do this right and we start emphasizing test, That'll naturally attract a younger cohort into our community, and it also gives the chance for our senior craftsmen to interact with our apprentices. So I highly recommend that if we can, let's look at how we can weave test and test activities into this entire in-space assembly, manufacturing, and servicing activity. I think it'll be a natural fit. I don't think we'll need to stretch hard uh, to make this fit. Now we come to the operational side. So from the president on down, we have been asked to consider a new space entity. Some of you in this room who are in NASA, and certainly I and my colleagues at Air Force Space Command will be involved in whatever that becomes. Our job, at least from an innovation perspective, is to get the technology that gives the widest options to whatever that future operational entity will be. I think uh, Doug Terrier at the very beginning talked a little bit about space traffic management. 
um, there is no doubt that right now our overlap between space traffic management and space situational awareness is incredibly strong and we're going to have to leverage that immediately if we aren't already doing so. And I know U.S. STRATCOM would be involved in that. Uh, I realize they may not be in the room, but as, as someone who knows how STRATCOM works, uh, we think this is a great area of future interaction. So industry, I think it's time. Uh, we started some good things. Um, license plates in space, be they RFID tags or optical tags. We've been working on DARPA has some things going on in that arena. Um, let, let's build on that uh, to help our operational entities. When it comes to the operational floors, there's going to be obvious changes in the way we interact human to machine, human on the loop. Um, I know Space Command has a long-term challenge with man on the loop and moving at scale. These were two of the key long-term challenges from Two, uh, two chief scientists ago, Air Force Base Command, before Mary Sanchez. But nevertheless, they are, they are true today. This activity lets us work on both of those activities, on the loop and at scale. Okay, so I borrowed a chart from Erica's um, briefings that were given at the AIA conference, and thank you that was very well done. It may not have reproduced very well in this format. It appears that some of the letters got moved around when it was transitioned. Apologies for that. But basically what you see here is um, NASA took the lead in a rather large effort. Every time you see a bubble, that's another group of people. So when you see a lot of bubbles, that's a lot of shepherding to do. And that's a lot of human time involved in, in making that work. And so again, um, hats off to NASA for making it happen. It's my job now to build on that and show an off-ramp that will enable NASA to continue doing what they're so good at, which we saw in the previous two talks, and gives the Air Force, or whatever we become as a space entity, certain uh, cross-cutting applications and benefits that we can then leverage in these future assets. So the input process output strategy here, I think has been briefed sufficiently that I won't spend a lot of time on it. So I'm gonna move on. Um, but for me, this was, this was a special moment because I joined this team about a year and a half, two years ago, and I've been with them ever since watching how this partnership developed. And I wanna keep that partnership going. Okay, so under this team, which was strongly analytic, and again, I, I have to call out that analytics does have to precede dis, uh, certain processes. We must think before we leap. Uh, NASA has been particularly good at this over the years. Uh, Air Force Space Command has been good in certain regimes in the past. We are currently in a revamping process. That's a lot about SMC 2.0, revamping the decision process and using analytics before you go to the East Coast to propose your programs and projects. And I know the MAGCOM is working very hard on improving how analytics are done. So even if we, we, we don't do in-space assembly, the fact that NASA showed us the importance of analytics and partnership and networking is a great lesson to the future strategy we take at SMC and at Space Command. I'm committed to that. And as you probably saw at the bottom of the first chart, I had to put there that these uh, items in these charts are my opinions, but I believe my opinions are backed up by certain factual information available to all of you. So I'll let you form your opinions. So under the in-space assembly analytics team, uh, the four concepts uh, were proposed by myself, Air Force Space Command, and Air Force Research Lab, primarily the RV directorate. Um, these are not in any way exclusive of each other. In fact, you'll probably see they have some pretty strong overlaps. I'm trying to find the right terminology. As you know, finding the right terms initially can make or break an effort as you go up your chain of command. So the four I chose. Space logistics, probably the broadest. Uh, developmental test, which speaks to that need to the workforce, hands-on, gotta do, gotta learn. Space power, which is uh, something we're hearing is of great interest on the East Coast, so we'd like to attract that interest into this program. And then, of course, my, my previous commentary, space situation awareness. So those four were proposed into the program a little over a year ago. 
um, to be considered by the analytics. Um, these were scored along with the other forum concepts from the other members of the partnerships across about 14 capability areas and then these analytics techniques came out with results uh, that have been reported elsewhere and I won't go into the details but it was extremely well done. I will use one of Excuse me, I will use one other graphic from that analytics uh, effort uh, just from a process perspective. But I, I will tell you, for those who had the chance to look at these papers, they were very, very good. I'm going to pick just one of the four due to time constraints, but I will tell you that likely space logistics could become the more important of, of the choices because in a war fighting construct, logistics wins the wars. Developmental test doesn't always win the wars and so on, power or situation awareness necessarily, but in the long run, in a warfighter's mind, logistics is the most important. So we're seeing a case emerge that logistics may be the long game, but we can't get there right away because of the way we're structured currently. So we're going to take a short game with developmental test. I'll try to merge that in with the long game with the MAGCOM and STRATCOM on space logistics, and we'll see where this takes us. So let's go with the short game for the moment, um, developmental test, and the advanced space-based test bed known as XST. Um, on 17 November 2017, I met with 40 other Air Force chief scientists, and I can't remember, Byron, were you with us at Edwards on that one? You were? Okay. Uh, Dr. Byron Knight. Um, the goal uh, by Dr. Greg Zacharias at the time, our Air Force chief scientist, was to expose the scientists to the realm of test. For those of you who have been to Edwards, you may know it is a facility that hosts uh, three or more uh, key government entities, NASA Dryden Armstrong, um, the AFMC AFLICMIC uh, aircraft testing facilities, and of course the Air Force Research Lab has its rocket lab there. So three rather large test entities. While we were touring all three of those entities over uh, a couple of days, I, I started to realize that facing me was the, the following issue. The air guys have done a great job over the years creating environments for testing. In fact, when I walked into one hangar and we were confronted with at least two or three parked F-35s, with technicians hooking up to them and working on them, and then we engaged in a conversation. It was, yeah, we're going to roll out in 20, 30 minutes. We're going to do a flight test. We're going to test the heads-up display. If the pilot doesn't like it, we're going to roll her back in. We're going to change it. We're going to roll her back out and do it again, over and over and over, fast. That really hit me because I had survived most of my career in space with uh, well, in three years we'll get to test, and then if that goes well, then maybe three years after that we'll get to test. And that was where I realized there was no speed. And if we were going to do anything about speed, it wasn't going to come through fixing the DD5000 acquisition strategy or any of those things. I thought the best way that speed could be brought about was through development test. And that's when I started on focusing people. TRL 5 to 7, cross the chasm, do your developmental test. So that's been the mantra since November of 17 that I've been driving home with folks. You've got to get us across the TRL 5 to 7 chasm as quickly and as cost effectively as possible. I will be looking there for, if you will, my government business case. I don't know if others will go down this path, but I certainly started that way down the path. I also coined the phrase Edwards of space to characterize the initial uh, thought effort uh, that we were using on, on this idea. Um, initially, it worked very well, especially with the Air Force test community, because in every TWIG, Test Evaluation Working Group, that I went to, there was at least half a room of Air Force guys from Edwards who immediately, when I said Edwards of space, they knew exactly what I was talking about, and they were on board, let's get going. It did make the Eglin people a little upset that I didn't choose Eglin, but that was just, just something they all had to deal with because I told them I didn't go on the chief scientist visit to Eglin. I went on the chief scientist visit to Edwards, and they, they all calmed down. But as soon as they calmed down, it was interesting. They said, you know, you've got the right foundation here. 
And so I was invited to propose to the Air Force Test Center for funding from the Air Force Test Center, not Air Force Base Command money, Air Force Test Center money. And for decades, the space side had not been getting really its fair share out of the Air Force Test Center for some very good reasons. And I'm hoping that some of those reasons will now change. I think we are making um, a good case here of why Air Force Test Center should help pay for uh, some of the facilities. Now remember, test center money does not pay for the articles under test. It does not pay for the ac access to that test range or whatever it becomes. But it will help defray the cost of the infrastructure of that test range. So when you look at that kind of a business case where there's cost sharing with test center, space command programs, uh, it can get to be very interesting. So uh, proposed to devise an in-space facility, not a ground facility, uh, for this developmental test, but allowing the other options, including uh, joint cross-agency, I'm looking at my, my other OGA colleagues. Um, we also believe operational testing evaluation is feasible, but under multi-level security could present us some issues. So we'd have to sneak up carefully on operational tests in a developmental environment, primarily because a lot of telemetry traditionally has been uncoded, unencrypted uh, during developmental test. Um, we believe this could support pervasive science and technology. That's the strongest foundation of the relationship between NASA, the Air Force, and others, is the, is the TRLs up to five, uh, and then we off-ramp it to our unique needs as needed um, after that. I've already spoken about industry getting involved. So imagine if you had an Air Force sponsor and you wanted to go up and test one of your articles um, as a candidate, you're, you're an industry partner. Well, just like the guy who rolls out the F-35 and flies it on the flight line, I'd like to roll out something else and do the same. So I'd like to extend that analogy and talk with you more, especially during afternoon sessions, if that's permitted, to explore this um, idea a little bit more. Without industry coming along with me, and I'm very aware of this being a product center, um, none of this goes anywhere. Um, and the last one, training, I am in the unique position that I do have to continue to work on the hands-on knowledge and finding the shortest path to operational uh, test and evaluation. The AFTC proposal is going to go in. It will come in a couple of pieces, but you've probably heard that the Air Force Test Center has been upped, I believe it's $250 million in their budget, and um, we would be above the cut line uh, for our proposal. So we'll see how that rolls out. So way back in November of 17 and through the Christmas holidays of 17 and into 18, I started doing some cartooning, uh, grabbing some things off the Internet, just to kind of get people started to think, what would a structure for XST look like? Originally, this was called Trust for, e Trust for Edwards of Space, um, but it was very basic. It had these kinds of things where NASA has already bought down a lot of the NRE for the ISM and ISA. Um, we could possibly bring a space plane into the uh, mix as a, as a means of interacting uh, with this asset. And then fun in the lower right uh, is an actual rendition, a cartoon of a former other space plane with uh, the idea. So, you know, nothing actually new, but technology has marched on. So we think this is uh, somewhat feasible for us to work together on. So here's the chart. I wish I could blow it up. Um, here's the chart that I think uh, Erica has used to great effect. Um, phase one, phase two, phase three, if you can't see those terms, those are the terms running vertically on the right-hand side of the diagram. You're in the phase three right now, lower right block, where we're trying to get you all to see what we've done together in phase one and phase two. Again, this is Erica and her team's product, primarily with the, the others of us joining in but I was particularly attached to the two blue blocks in the middle, the concept definition, the concept analysis. And that's where I actually leveraged their work and stood on uh, their shoulders. Um, I think the biggest thing off of here is going to be the shared roadmaps because I want to share my roadmaps with industry. So now here's my rendition of Erica's charts. Sorry, not as pretty colorful as, as the others. But you'll notice that the phase one is nearly identical, so I'm building off of that. What was changed in the lower part of phase one 
was that we held a material innovation working group on the 23rd to 25th of October. We had 40 um, practitioners from the community, including some of our NASA colleagues attend. Our goal was to build knowledge of the CONOPS, the requirements, the cost uh, analysis required, and the acquisition strategy, which is the baseline for every program in the Air Force. And after two days of very hard work, we arrived at a fairly decent um, level of detail that we are now willing to package up and pass on to this community, and we'll be doing that shortly. Everything we did those two days will be available to industry. Um, unlike some of the other activities where we take it in and we have to keep it within government channels, uh, this will be communicated to the commercial sector through the box that says, Gap in XST technology development, develop our position, the government's position, show those technology development roadmaps with their gaps to industry, and my goal there is primarily through an IRAD interaction process, and then get a two-way dialogue going. So that's the strategy that we've used and why this meeting is so important to me because hopefully this afternoon, with this in mind, we will have a platform to work together. Um, my MAGCOM hopefully will be able to help us with some of the return uh, on investment discussions. We have to keep a feedback loop going so that everyone is synchronized in this process. I certainly need more inputs from the MAGCOM on whether we can feasibly do a space logistics um, capability team. I think that's the likely direction we should be looking and maybe in the next uh, uh, two years would be the right timing. So I've come to the end of my about half hour with you to keep us all on track. Um, again, kind of a pared down version. Uh, I've taken you on a little journey, a NASA Air Force journey. Um, we've offered you an advanced space-based test bed as an off-ramp concept that will leverage all ISA, M, and S capabilities. Um, industry in the room, I think there is a government business case for both the Air Force and NASA. We will try to develop that business case. A lot of non-recurring engineering is complete um, thanks to the space station teams over the years as well as the, the Goddard team on Restore L, the DARPA team on RSGS, and maybe unspoken, the CONFERS team at DARPA and the way they've been working on modular open architectures and standards. We will definitely need that to stay synchronized. I think we can keep down the cost if we partner, at least up till the TRL-5 moment of decision, and then if we can test things more rapidly um, in space, we will leap from five to seven rapidly. I am very interested in hearing industry's perspective. Thank you very much for your time. I will, I will be here as long as it takes. Um, I'm Dan Mosqueda from SRI International. Quick question, uh, when you had space power on one slide, w could you define what you meant by space power? Was it literally energy or force? Over the years, there's been a um, interest in gathering up more energy from the sun, but off the planet. So uh, as solar array technology and large structures have evolved, we see an opportunity to gather more energy off planet and possibly move that energy to do things to our bidding. And that's the foundation of that space power comment. Uh, we do know, and you probably know as well, there is a space power project being discussed right now. So um, until that is formally announced, I don't want to get too far ahead of folks, but I'm just letting you know it's out there. Thanks, Roberta. Next up is our DARPA presentation. Joe Parrish couldn't be here today due to a review. So Bernie Kelm of the NRL will present. He is the RSGS Deputy Program Manager. Bernie. Okay. 
Thanks, Erica. Thanks for shepherding this group and bringing us all together. And so I want to start off by offering sincere apologies from, from Joe Parrish. We had one of our major design reviews for RSGS happen to fall on this week, and there was no other time. It could be scheduled at, the, at this year, and keeping the flight program on track is paramount, uh, but this is really important too. And so I am very glad that I am here, and I know DARPA was very glad that they could have me here as, as Joe's stand-in. So I'd also like to thank our, our previous speakers already today, uh, Keith and Harley and Roberta, all, all good friends, and you are going to help me out on my presentation because a lot of the points that you've made are just going to be echoed here, and I'm really excited to see how, without rehearsing, we, we've brought all these different groups of the government uh, together, and we're really looking at largely the same message. So let's see. That didn't work. <clears throat> So RSGS, Robotic Servicing of Geosynchronous Satellites, uh, it's a program that we have been working, uh, NRL and DARPA, and now uh, DARPA partnered with SSL um, to, to bring to orbit to really create a, a dexterous robotic servicing capability in GEO. Uh, choosing GEO is where we want to go because it's a high importance orbit uh, for both commercial systems and DOD systems offering 24-hour coverage over the earth, and it's a great place to have the first servicer be able to service multiple clients. And RSGS being able to service multiple clients over its lifetime is, is critically important. Um, we have four mission areas across the bottom that are important for the government. Uh, the first one is to be able to cooperatively inspect satellites uh, at, at very close range. Uh, we've had seen some satellite failures on orbit where we've been told if we could inspect these cold solder joints, we would know what went wrong and we could design it to operate better in the future. Uh, if we have a mechanical deployment anomaly and we want to know what went wrong, how do we, how do we not do that in the future, or can we even fix it with our SGS? Uh, that, that very close inspection um, from centimeters to meters is our, our first mission area uh, that's, that's really important. Second one we do encounter um, well, the second is, is orbit adjust. We will have the capability of rendezvous and dock uh, with our robot arms and use these robot arms that are strong arms that will be able to take the loads for doing orbital repositioning um, to, to use our own fuel to, to help if we need something that needs to be moved around within the geo belt um, or to or from uh, the graveyard. Um, we may also we'll be picking up, and I'll come to this in a second, picking up our potential resupply uh, for RSGS and moving that to where we need it. Uh, third is correct uh, mechanical deployment anomalies. There are some anomalies that have happened on orbit where a robot arm could come in and often with just fingertip level of force could provide something that could save a vehicle. Um, so every one of those will be case by case, but if we get one of those, it'll, it'll justify our value right there in a single, a single servicing, especially with some of our, our government systems approaching a billion dollars each. Uh, finally, and the one that really is going to be talked about most today, is to be able to cooperatively install self-contained payloads, upgrade systems that weren't designed to be upgraded. Uh, nobody today, maybe outside the International Space Station, has a USB port on orbit. Uh, something that you could plug into and have mechanical power data. Uh, but we have looked at how RSGS can take the very first steps of assembly and install something uh, on a system that uh, wasn't designed to be upgraded. It would be a mechanical deployment. That upgrade package would have to be self-contained. It will have its own power, its own downlink. We envision it right now as something about the size of a dorm fridge. Uh, and we've seen some good mission areas that we could we could do that. We could have new deep space sensors looking out. Uh, we could have new earth observing sensors. We could have local space situational awareness for systems that aren't designed uh, to know what's going on in their environment. So those are the four mission areas. RSGS is on track to launch uh, spring of 2021, uh, which is why keeping the design review this week was really important for Joe. So now we're going to get to the part where a lot of my slides are going to echo what, you, what you've already heard. Um, I think of when I'm looking at satellite servicing, uh, a couple of analogies come to mind. Um, I take a look at the, the fleet maintenance aspect of this. Um, we don't send an aircraft carrier out to do its mission without support ships 
to also join the fight uh, without destroyers and subs. And without them, along with them, we have logistic ships. We have ships that aren't executing that mission, but they are helping those, that part of the, that fleet uh, execute their mission. For space, the concept of looking at our space investment as a fleet hasn't existed before this technology has come about. So looking at how the logistics of space can, can really be executed with a, with a robotic server, robotic servicer is a, is a key part of what RSGS is, is looking to do. Um, so this one, uh, I think uh, Keith really, really covered well for me. Uh, that we, we all know in the room where we are today with single fairing constraints, not being able to respond to failures, uh, and having, having capabilities that we can't change or upgrade once we're on orbit. So, Keith, thank you for the, the, the great analogy of the tripod. Uh, and we are we're really focusing with RSGS on the first leg of the tripod as our, as our primary mission area, satellite servicing. Uh, but then taking a look at what can we do with RSGS at GEO, much like RestoreL is looking at in LEO, can it be a platform for assembly? If there's platforms for assembly experiments that should happen at GEO, DARPA would welcome RSGS being used for that, and we can start planning those now. So here's another uh, a close up artist concept of RSGS. Uh, it's going to have uh, two robot arms. We've got the, the friend robot arms uh, that SSL is developing for us. Uh, we are going to have a suite of tools. Uh, I've lost count of how many tools uh, we're looking at in this, on this mission. It will probably be well north of 10. Um, plus SSL may bring additional tools uh, that I'm I'm not aware of right now, though I guess if I was at the design review, I, I'd be learning a little bit more. Um, we're going to have all the sensors we need for doing autonomous relative navigation for the, the final, final approach to grapple from tens of meters to single meter, where we can have the robot arm reach out and execute grapple. Um, docking with fixed uh, structural hard points, such as the, the launch vehicle interface. It's already on the vehicles at GEO. So these, Servicing for systems that were not designed to be serviced um, is where DARPA is looking to hopefully break the chicken and the egg problem of there's not a servicer today because there's not satellites other than Hubble and ISS designed to be serviced. And satellites aren't designed to be serviced because there's nothing there to service them. Uh, this is a, a public-private partnership uh, between DARPA and SSL. Uh, so the the mandate to, to leverage commercial capabilities uh, is in play on this uh, for DARPA. Uh, DARPA will operate RSGS for the first six to nine months uh, as a government mission, and then it will be transitioned to industry uh, to operate uh, for hopefully a decade or more. So we have been at NRL, so I'm the, the deputy program manager at NRL uh, for the robotic payload, and I have been part of this mission since it began in 2003. Um, we have done a lot of work building up the, the technology foundation uh, for this program. When we started, uh, what I was, when I would talk to leadership that we want to rendezvous and dock with satellites not designed to be docked with, most often told that we were crazy. Uh, at NRL, we welcome that. Um, and leadership would give me reasons why they thought it wouldn't work. As we've built up this technology foundation of going through showing how we would do autonomous rendezvous and docking. We did a competitive procurement and we procured the, the friend robot arm that you see up there in the top left. Uh, we've done full scale hardware in the loop rendezvous docking um, with ground prototypes and flight prototypes of that robot arm. Uh, just as important as the hardware, I'll often describe our program as half invisible. Uh, we have the software and the algorithms uh, that we also have on a rapidly maturing path to flight. Um, to, there's just not a really good picture you can show of software, um, to be able to, to run on algorithms that we can actually fly. One of the criticisms we would get from the beginning was, guys, you can't fly a crazy supercomputer. There's no way you can do this. I'm like, well, actually we can. We, we've worked out what it takes for the algorithms and what it takes for flyable processors and have that working. Um, as we've been developing this for RSGS, we've been developing the robotics ground workstation so that we will have human in the loop providing supervision over the autonomous rendezvous and docking. Once we get rid of that, that first phase where we have two vehicles, each with six degrees of freedom and limited situational awareness to the ground and time delay, and things are docked and stable, 
we will have the humans do the part of the mission that they can do best. So if we are looking at an anomaly resolution, installing an upgrade package, we, we do not need to develop unique machine learning and autonomy for those aspects. We can have a ground operator that's well trained and that we're bringing that training into our mission right from the beginning. Uh, we have developed over the years um, a pretty awesome complement of tools. Um, not all of these tools are going to go on RSGS. Uh, we've looked at a couple of different mission applications over our years, uh, but we're going to have a tool for doing the Marmon grapple. Uh, we're going to have a tool uh, for retrieving upgrade packages, or we call it our pod capture tool. Uh, we're going to probably have a tool for interfacing with Liquid Apogee Engine, if that's necessary, docking interface, and uh, a small number of other tools. Uh, we have taken the, the flight prototype robotics uh, through environmental testing. Uh, we will be getting our flight arms uh, next year, and we'll continue taking them, um, our, our redesigned flight arms through flight testing, and we've been developing um, a lot of test beds so that we can do full-scale hardware in the loop testing. And I know Mike Mook on our next presentation will show you a little bit more of that. So Erica, yell at me when I'm getting close. Uh, I think I'm two minutes, all right. Um, so for bringing RSGS into assembly, uh, as part of DARPA has also developed uh, pods, which is a way of getting small packages up to, to GEO. Uh, I've done that with SSL as part of the Phoenix program. Uh, I'm going to show another picture on the next, next chart. Uh, but looking at how uh, the, the logistics chain can work on bringing up replacement, bringing up new experiments, bringing up new tools, new, new things to be installed, uh, could come up by a pod that RSGS could then rendezvous and dock and then go to a, a client spacecraft and install. Uh, but that's not the only way it can come up. Over on the right, uh, if it's something for a different form factor, a little larger, diff different reason it needs to go up a different way, go up via an ESPA uh, as a secondary on another launch or, as a, or even as a dedicated if it's the, the right thing for the robotics to work with. So uh, here is one picture of the pod deployment system and the pod ejected. This case is showing uh, a pod bay in the top left uh, with multiple things that could be unpacked and used for a servicing mission. Uh, all of our pods will have a pod grapple fixture. It's the one place on our mission where we got to design both sides of the interface. So we worked with MDA and took some technology from Orbital Express so that we could really facilitate docking with a small object. Uh, here's a few more pictures. Um, the, the pod has, has flown. Uh, details are still proprietary and I, I can't share, but I can say I've seen photos and video and the deployment was excellent. Um, it came off nice and smooth. Um, and so we're very excited that that's a new capability. Uh, and then um, here again, I'm gonna thank, thank everybody that spoke before me. I don't really think I need to go into the benefits of satellite servicing and how that can lead to in-space assembly uh, expanding our national capabilities, both for, for government and commercial missions, uh, build things that are larger than fairings, make to the point that we trust in designing our vehicles to have modular replacements, uh, upgrades inherent, um, build things, build large apertures, build large space-based solar power. Um, so that will really help me save some time. And again, the payoffs. I think everybody here uh, knows the payoffs uh, for DARPA. DARPA is really focused on this being a sustained capability, not just a short demonstration, something that can really make a difference and we can really take a look at, at what it can do to change the way we, we do things in space. Um, as everybody's already said, quicker, lower cost payload integration, uh, variety of means of getting things to orbit, rapid tech refresh, uh, I'll sometimes in the lab pull out my iPhone and say, I want to bring the iPhone development cycle to space, where what I bought two years ago is no good a year from now, and I will happily spend my money again. So that's my, my crash course for RSGS. I'll be around all day. Uh, I'd be happy to welcome any questions, and I'm sure uh, Joe Parrish would welcome hearing from anybody as well. Thank you, Bernie. Also from uh, the Naval Research Lab next, we have Michael Mook. Uh, he's a branch head in the spacecraft control systems. Great, thank you.
Thank you, Erica. And thank you very much, NASA, for hosting uh, this, this element of the S&T uh, enterprise work that we're, that we're doing and that we've, uh, for, for getting NRL involved in it very, very early on also. Uh, we're very happy to be part of, of this activity and engaging all of you with uh, the technology that we've been able to uh, help bring forward and uh, kind of lay the foundation for what I think will be um, a very, uh, very important direction in the, in the future with uh, uh, in-space assembly. There's, of course, many different directions to go with in-space assembly, and we can spend a lot of time doing studies and things like that, but it's until we are able to uh, move forward and do some experiments in space that we're really going to start understanding what the, uh, what the impacts, the benefits, and the cost of that sort of thing will be. So uh, very, very proud to be part of that, that activity. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit now into kind of the beginnings of NRL. Bernie talked uh, from the DARPA RSGS, per RSGS perspective. I'm going to talk ab about the NRL side of that and, uh, and try to link it up with the, the in-space assembly fu going future uh, towards the end of this presentation. And that is not what I want to do. All right, need some help. Thank you. Oh, wow, nicely done. You went well done. You started from the beginning. All right. It's all right, I only have 30 minutes of charts to put into 15 minutes, but we're fine. <laughs> okay. It's not sliding, it's not by. Thank you. I'm going to exit and get out in case we get back to a funky setting. So. So maybe don't use that one. Yeah, maybe don't use that one. <laughs> okay, here we go. And there you go, sir. All right, thank you, Gunnar. Okay, so the Naval Research Lab um, was established back in, uh, in 1923, so we've had 95 years and coming up on 100 years of, of uh, innovation. Uh, and, and I grabbed a couple quotes here, one from Edison that um, basically was, was one of the um, an initial uh, formations for this. And uh, basically that there should be a lab that provides R&D at no vast cost. And that has definitely been the focus of a lot of things that we've done at the lab to make sure that that uh, is, is possible. And we, we look at technologies that are, are currently available and how we might be able to modify those and also doing some, some initial basic research to see how we could improve that and, and move it along. Also from the Honorable Joe da Daniels uh, at the time, uh, the imperative needs, needs would be utilizing the natural inventive genius of Americans to meet the new conditions of warfare. And, and as, as you all know, as we, we move through things here, we, we have new conditions. Things are changing quite a bit, and we need to be able to address those on, on multiple levels. So I think we're, we're accomplishing this, and uh, very be proud to be part of, part of the organization. Uh, since that time, we've uh, broadened out into many different areas. And I put this up here, not so much to show uh, the percentages there, which is this is our 6162 research portfolio. And so we do get some, some basic research and some applied research funds. But what I'd like to point out with this is that in order for an endeavor like autonomous systems in space or robotics in space and things like to, to progress, it takes a broad range of, of activities. And having knowledge in many different areas, whether it's machine learning, machine vision, uh, artificial intelligence, any of those types of things, or even the cyber aspects of, of, uh, of, of these activities, they're all addressed, uh, thankfully for me and for the folks that work with me at the Naval Research Lab. We can reach out very easily to, to these folks. And as we look forward to uh, in-space assembly, and I think Roberta pointed this out, it takes a lot of different people and we have to increase the pace of that, that we do things. Um, and having that access, having people that have experience in those areas, really does help us do that. And the Naval Research Lab, in one form or another, uh, has been in space since almost the start of NRL, uh, since the 1950s. I'm not going to go through this as, 
this is what was it, what did you call it, um, Harley, the, the, uh, the honor list or the boast list or something. So this is, this is us. Um, we have done spacecraft systems from class DCD through class A, from CubeSats to, to large uh, vehicles and uh, uh, man-rated uh, vehicles as well. Um, and, and so trying to keep with the, you know, focus on the things that you can do, um, NASA has been, been looking at in-space assembly for a very long time. And it wasn't with us until uh, the late 90s that we looked at it and said, hey, actually, there's something we can do here. And so, so we uh, started by making a capital investment in, in our robotics uh, facility. This is our proximity operations test bed. Uh, and I can give you more information on that if, if you're not familiar with it. And, and certainly we can set up for tours over at the lab for those that are interested. But we, we started getting into taking a look at how would you assemble things, how would you, how would you uh, go about testing and, and, and doing um, uh, the various aspects of what you needed to do in space and realize we needed a laboratory, uh, a facility like the Proxop test bed to uh, continue that work. And, uh, and since that time and, and working with DARPA, and, and if you have the pleasure of working with DARPA, it's, it's certainly a pleasure for us because um, they are very focused on making progress quickly and challenging all aspects of that program. And that's really uh, what we need to do to be able to keep moving forward in, in these endeavors. So starting in 2004 with SUMO, going through uh, to 2000, and, and, and right after that, developing the friend arm, which uh, has provided a lot of capabilities to, uh, uh, to the RSGS program, also, also the Restore program, um, through um, transferring some of that technology there. Um, and then demonstrating our grapple capabilities, completely autonomous grapple, uh, you know, RPO docking uh, type capabilities. And then uh, 2013, starting up with, uh, after some um, application studies, starting up with the Phoenix program at DARPA, and then now moving on to uh, the RSGS program. So we've been able to demonstrate many different aspects and essentially space qualify the robotic arm and, and throughout that process as well. The, uh, the, the middle bottom picture that you see there, that's, that's uh, testing in our um, plasma chamber at the Naval Research Lab to basically figure out what happens when you have a vehicle that might be at one charge, NGO that goes up to another vehicle at a different charge level, and would you get arcing, what kind of damage comes from that arcing, and what mitigations would you need to have to do that. So that's one of the benefits to having these facilities all in one place or at least available um, and that we can quickly get in there and, and test these types of things. Uh, and in parallel with uh, the, the great work we've been able to do with DARPA, we have our own internal IRAD activities, and uh, this is what I showed you kind of early on in the, in the charts there. Um, I've got three of those here, and there's, there's more on the way. So BICEP was, was being able to, uh, was in a 6-2 activity looking at being able to operate two arms at the same time uh, and uh, in, in cooperation to be able to, in this case, find the gap that's between the spacecraft and a solar array uh, and insert a tool into that gap, apply some pressure, and release a stuck solar array. And this is done completely autonomously with, with uh, uh, the sensors that we were applied to that 6-2 program. The next one live was uh, a project where you've got, in this case, you can see the spheres um, a vehicle on a, on a floating pad. And, uh, and it, was to, it deploys from a host vehicle. It does an inspection task, and then it reattaches to the host vehicle. That allowed us to develop algorithms for being able to do that sort of thing. Uh, it, it allowed us to develop with, uh, uh, with Aurora Flight Sciences a, uh, a, a board that had two cameras on it that was useful for doing the fly around and also for, uh, for object avoidance. And then realizing and then using the technology, the, the experience that we've learned from uh, our robotic arm development, we wanted to push into a smaller arm form factor to be able to use that for small satellites, and we uh, had an activity going on there. And, and all of these, the, the, you know, the important thing for us is we love to develop the technologies, but it has to transition to something. It has to move on. So uh, we very much like uh, look for partners to be able to work with so we can transition that technology to, to those. Um, we talked a little bit about, Bernie talked about these facilities in the interest of time. I'm not going to spend really that much time on it. You can see, uh, let me hit some of the important recent ones. Machine Vision Lab. 
uh, is for developing al algorithms for, of course, uh, visual serving, machine vision, you know, under different lighting conditions for different types of uh, um, features. Uh, and we're focusing quite a bit on modeling and simulation at this point because, of course, you can do a lot more algorithm development and testing at the, uh, at the simulation level if you can get uh, all the details. Uh, and then on the far right is a uh, high fidelity joint um, uh, uh, test bed where we can work on our joint algorithms, our control algorithms, our uh, compliance control algorithms at, at a very uh, detailed level, high fidelity level. Test facilities in NRL, um, I think most of you are familiar with uh, the test facilities you need for space. And it'll be interesting as we try to move into space and assemble there rather than uh, you know, how much of this, this uh, infrastructure we need to take with us and whether we can just have it on one vehicle or two vehicles or three vehicles to do, to do the types of things we need to do for assembly. Um, and then flight architecture, so on, on, on all programs, especially as we find out on, on robotics programs, it is imperative to have this full end-to-end -end architecture to be able to look at your operations uh, in detail develop the procedures for that. Make sure your flight software is operating the way it's supposed to, your flight management's operating the way it's supposed to. So as, as soon as we can, we get to this level and we just keep iterating up from that point. And, and uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we have this um, in, actually in two different uh, locations now. Um, oh, that was backwards. Uh, the friend arm. I'm actually going to skip that and not go into detail on it, but it has helped us with uh, all our endeavors since then. Um, this is a, a chart that, uh, that shows all of the different elements or m a lot of the larger elements on, on the RSGS program. And I, I put this here for a different reason than what that Bernie had. Um, this shows that NRL partners, works with, procures things from industry all the time. And, and we will look at some something that we need for a system like this and decide is it something that we can purchase and if we can purchase it it's the best way to go and if we can't purchase it or have something purchased modified then we have the ability to build it in-house but we prefer not to do that when when we don't have to uh, so there are a number of in-house builds there uh, the cre module at the very bottom is an important one because that allows us to continue all of our other developments the robotic processing module and so forth while um, while industry develops the tools and the, and the equipment that will plug into that, into that processor module. Uh, so that provides, the CRE provides all the interfaces to that and can be changed as, as time goes on. Um, so I've kind of rearranged everything in this case just to show the progression in terms of matur maturity. So we start with the very low TRL at the bottom left and we move up towards the right. If you look at some of the other things that we want to do, this is for on-orbit servicing. If we are going to go now to in-space assembly uh, or, or uh, well, in-space assembly in, in different ways, actually. So some of it I've listed in the arrow there, upgrading existing DOD spacecraft, improving technology, time to orbit, and so forth. Uh, another thing that we're working on very much at NRL is solar space, uh, space solar power. All right, so that's basically what Roberto was talking about with having a large solar farm and looking at uh, developing, actually, at this point, component technology for converting that to microwave and transmitting that to the ground. So if, if you were now to take that whole set of boxes and shift it over into 2020 and replace everything with space solar power, that's another path that we're on, and hopefully those things will, will have to link up, I think. Uh, and, and so... You know, in terms of where we see the future going, this, that's one of, the, one of the areas very much where, where we see that going. Um, and then another aspect of this, and I've, I'm one minute over, so I'm going to make this pretty quick, but um, in terms of being able to speed up the technology insertion into, into our space programs, we, you know, we learned some things from our space programs. We realized that we could apply that to marine and terrestrial applications, so we've been doing that. And then you take your marine and terrestrial applications, which are moving at light speed right now, and you start moving that technology into the space domain. So we can go back and forth across those domains. Uh, and we've identified three different areas that re really focus our energy, and I'm sure you guys have, have others as well. Um, lastly, like I said, we, we like to transfer all of our technology. We don't like to work on more than one thing at a time. Uh, one thing. We don't want to work on it again. We don't want to have a version two, version three, and four, and so forth. 
Um, so we like to transition that out to other people and work with them during that transition. Ideally, it happens around PDR uh, when that transition starts to happen. And there's different methods or, or uh, ways that we can do that. So uh, recapping, um, there's been a significant internal investment that I think you know, was focused on space servicing. Uh, that's the first big step that needs to happen. We can demonstrate a lot of the things that are, that are required for in-space assembly with space servicing. Uh, we are leading national efforts in in-space robotics along with, uh, in, with other people and, and uh, certainly the, our friends at uh, the Air Force and, and, uh, and NASA. Um, we do have unique capabilities I've shown you and, and really, as Bernie pointed out, a lot of it's in the algorithms and software that takes a lot of time to, to develop. Um, and we'll continue doing this. You know, we'll continue investing in, in our 6162 stuff that we can then bring into, into other areas. Uh, we're investing, uh, trying to invest in uh, teleoperations, how we make that more effective, uh, space situational awareness, how we make that more effective. Um, and those are, those are all at the uh, 6162 level that will bubble up into the 6364. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Mike. Our next three, three presentations will be from our ST Partnership in Space Assembly Facilitation and Analysis Team. You'll see a couple of charts that Roberta mentioned. And first up, Dr. Philip, Philip Williams. Thank you, Erica, for the introduction. Uh, as Erica shared, um, the next three presentations you hear, inclusive of mine, will be from the uh, SNT In Space Assembly Facilitation and Analysis Team. Our, our goal, essentially, as our name states, uh, uh, is to facilitate the technical interchange among the SNT government agencies, uh, as well as be the stewards of the data collection and analysis of, of the data in that exchange, uh, uh, to report that out to the enterprise as a whole. Uh, as well as to the respective agencies, as well as to uh, the general public. Uh, this first talk, really, will, this talk uh, that I'm going to give actually will set the stage for uh, describing the value proposition. We've heard some of that before. Uh, the strategic framework, thank you, Roberta. She's given a nod to that earlier. Uh, we're actually going to go through a list of some of the capability needs uh, that the partnership as a whole has, um, has dialogued about for in-space assembly. Um, so first thing I like to do, is actually show our entire facilitation analysis team. This work couldn't been, could, have, could not have been done uh, without the great contributions from my whole team. So uh, I know those streaming can't see them, but I would like for those on our team to uh, please stand during this moment if you could. Uh, so those in the room could again just uh, see the facilitation analysis team members. Uh, thank you team again for all the great work to this point. Uh, what you see in the list of names here uh, are our team inclusive of those at NASA headquarters, NASA Langley, uh, NASA, NASA Glenn, as well as um, several students. It was touched on earlier about the importance of the, the academic side, the need to, uh, to interface with students who are the future of our workforce. And so uh, OCT, I think, is proud to say that we've had nine students engaged with this activity uh, since, since our inception as the facilitation analysis team. Uh, and Three of them are actually here today. Uh, you've seen their smiling faces greeting you through the door as they walk through the door. Uh, but I just want to definitely want to uh, emphasize that the nine students we've engaged thus far have made valuable contributions on this team. And so we thank them for that as well. And um, we realize the products that we'll share are due in no small part due to their efforts. I think a lot of this has been said before, so what you're here today, uh, in, in the interest of time, I'll just touch on some things, but I think, uh, yeah, I realize a lot of this we've heard before, so I'm just echoing that. Uh, I think it's interesting that we've heard that throughout our t many of our talks this morning, um, so uh, hopefully that, that emphasizes the importance of, 
of uh, the new paradigm that Keith Belvin actually started off with his talk describing. Uh, Roberta sharing that when we think about the traditional way of building spacecraft, that leads to those spiraling costs. Um, when you consider the cost of the payload, the launch vehicles, um, the reliability involved, the larger payloads, all of that uh, becomes a, a, a cycle that potentially could be broken as we talked earlier as well about low cost commercial uh, systems and spacecraft uh, that could be available uh, to help us in that endeavor. Uh, we've heard earlier about advances in automation and robotics. We've heard from uh, DARPA as well as NRL uh, regarding those. Uh, not only from the building up of large structures, as we heard earlier, but as, as Keith alluded to, on a smaller end of the spectrum as well with, uh, with smaller satellites. Um, we realize that these technologies, as I said, can reduce the cost of developing and launching new systems. Uh, a lot of that goes in hand in hand with once they're launched, uh, there's the concern for repairing the vehicles and upgrading the satellites, and we believe that this new paradigm encompasses those things as well. Uh, Keith also talked earlier about the in-space, uh, the on-orbiter in-space uh, three-legged stool, um, in-space assembly being one, in-space servicing, as well as in-space manufacturing, and we understand that there could be significant, ec significant economic impact uh, and performance benefits when we consider all of those three together uh, as cross-cutting capabilities, remaining on the cutting edge of that, uh, to enable advancements beyond the state of the art. And if we recall, um, again, when we think about the inception of a mission to its end of life, that could easily be uh, approximately 40 years. So by the time a mission is ended, it can be, you know, 40-year-old technology. We understand the advancement of technology today. That's, um, that could be prohibitive to what we want to do in terms of our own individual operational missions as well as how we want to collaborate, collaborate uh, within the government uh, space uh, uh, realm itself. So just a nod to that, actually. Um, and again, with the previous slides, we've heard of the tremendous benefits to be gained from in-space assembly and servicing, bringing about those new capabilities, uh, evolving uh, individual spacecraft uh, in response to uh, new knowledge gain, new technologies, uh, new systems and techniques can be brought online. Um, we understand that in utilizing in-space assembly and servicing, uh, mis our mission success could be less dependent on the things that we consider at launch and focus on those things that are on orbit. We still have to consider that things can fill on orbit. Um, yet we potentially open up a trade space for options for recovery uh, that can reduce the costs uh, and making the systems more reliable. Um, so again, what you see at the bottom, the, uh, the bottom three slides, I won't go through those. I think we've heard all those before, the modularity, the reusability, uh, the extensibility. Uh, all pointing towards three main goals that we've heard, I believe, throughout, throughout the talks today uh, in terms of significant benefits for reducing costs, improving performance, and limiting the risk, if you will. Okay. So when we consider the current activities, uh, which is part of the discussion and the reason we're here today, uh, between the government uh, as well as commercial uh, enterprises and activities, uh, we recognize that um, the government is currently investing, and you've heard much of those today. This afternoon, uh, we'll get, have the opportunity to hear about some of the commercial uh, opportunities and activities and investments in in-space assembly, uh, primarily, and with an eye to understanding how there could be public-private partnerships uh, uh, motivated by the need for that continuous capability improvement and development. So uh, we hope that when we consider the technology and capability of maturation, that, that could benefit from that cooperative aspect towards a shared goal. And so to that effect, as you've heard earlier, Michelle actually mentioned that, uh, gave us an overview of the S&T partnership. Uh, we've come to a place where the U.S. government space agencies have produced an agreement uh, to explore the next steps in a possible cooperative endeavor. Uh, and that's, uh, that brings us to the S&T partnership. Uh, Roberta, as not to you, I know you had this slide earlier, so this is a little bit cleaner slide. Hopefully that, that helps you. Um, but again, won't spend too much time here since, uh, since again, Michelle has shared that and Roberta has shown that in, in a different form. Uh, this is just a landing slide in, in my presentation and our team's uh, presentations for the s and partnership just to refocus us on what the partnership is. Again, a strategic forum uh, from our perspective established in 2015, yet I think Roberta has shared that uh, the history goes back farther, definitely, in terms of collaboration among uh, the government space agencies. Um, 
as it was mentioned earlier, I believe Douglas Terrier and Roberta as well may have mentioned uh, the partnership as a whole had identified uh, about 16 pervasive goals, what we're calling collaboration topic areas, um, that can be game-changing key technologies across the host of, uh, of uh, t uh, fields within science and technology in the government space. Um, the s and partnership as itself has three principal partners. Uh, as you've seen here with the logos, uh, the U.S. Uh, Air Force, specifically Spaceman, as well as affiliate partners, uh, NASA, as well as NRO. And the partnership goals essentially were, are to uh, leverage synergies through the coordination of the s and issues across uh, the agencies and then also influence the agency portfolios by efficiently and effectively managing the s and resources. Uh, these goals can be accomplished by the following objectives shown in the orange box at the bottom. Three high-level objectives uh, involving facilitating those cross-agency collaboration strategies uh, on technical solutions on those common pervasive goals or collaboration topic areas. Uh, maintaining awareness of each agency's s and investments to reduce duplication and identify areas where we can collaborate. Um, and then finally, identify those impediments to collaboration and formulate solutions. As it was shared earlier, uh, again, by the previous presenters, uh, from an s and partnership perspective, there are several affiliate partners, uh, several of which are listed here. Um, and uh, in terms of topics, the partnership has already stepped through uh, four topics, with InSpace Assembly being the one that we're here, we're assembled here for. Uh, what I'd like to share, though, is, and as we've heard earlier, that although this activity is focused uh, on in-space assembly, there is an acknowledgement of the relationship between in-space assembly, in-space servicing, as well as in-space in manufacturing. And so to the extent we see those intersections, we definitely acknowledge that and, 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 and there's acknowledge that in our analysis and in what we report out in terms of recommendations. Um, what I'd also like to point out here is that although you see all uh, seven, uh, affiliate part seven affiliate partners listed here. Um, for the collaboration topic area of in-space assembly, I like to call it that actually it was Air Force uh, AFRL, AFSMC, as you've heard earlier, DARPA and DARPA and NRL. Uh, and that uh, is exactly why earlier this morning you've heard those talks from those specific agencies. Okay. So as, again, we've heard earlier, what's the value in in-space assembly for government space agencies, right? Um, well, our team, in collaboration with the partnership as a whole, stepped through a process of understanding the value proposition itself, uh, kind of like a three-prong, uh, uh, a, a, a three-stage effort, if you will. Identifying the values as the first step, just understanding the, what the stakeholders value and expect. And by stakeholders, we define those as the S&T partnership agencies and the nation as a whole, right? The taxpayers that are paying our, our bills here. Uh, as well as the next step is understanding, um, with an understanding of the values, develop a proposition for uh, how we can meet those stakeholder expectations. And that um, quite simply involved looking at ways to increase performance, uh, how we reduce costs, and how we re can reduce the technology refresh time. Uh, with the identification of proposition in hand, the third step would actually be to, under, to, to deliver that value. Uh, and from our team's perspective, that would be through the data we gathered, the analysis we've done, the technical interchanges, uh, culminating in recommendations, excuse me, for collaboration to achieve that value. What I'd like to emphasize next really is uh, as we and I show, we, you saw, I didn't, I didn't point out in the previous slide with the value proposition as the first step to identify values. Um, we came upon uh, certain values that the partnership agreed upon as an inter enterprise effort. Again, touching on the three principal partners as well as the four affiliate uh, partners as well. And many of these values you see here defined um, have been uh, discussed earlier today, resilience, as Keith Belvin shared. Uh, we've understood the value of military utility across uh, with our DOD partners, upgradability, uh, scientific progress, space exploration, uh, as well as persistence. Again, something that we've heard uh, a lot previously. So with these um, values in hand, uh, that form the basis for our value proposition process. And uh, based upon that, we then developed uh, a strategic framework. Another slide, again, shown earlier, uh, 
shown in, in full color here. Uh, <laughs> and so our team developed a strategic framework, really, um, for understanding the needs and advantages for in-space assembly. And so with the need to anticipate the future of in-space robotic capabilities, uh, rather than react to them, uh, this strategic framework lays out uh, how the advantages of those new robotic technologies with government and commercial engagement uh, could enhance in-space uh, assembly uh, servicing uh, as capabilities and reduce future costs. And so what you see here, the framework that, um, that was decided upon and brought in by the partnership uh, encompasses three phases. Uh, and within the various phases, you see some of the activities, you see some of the various gates for agreement or disagreement to go forward. You see also uh, from each phase that return on investment going back to the initial partnership goals and objectives, which are important, right, to stay locked on our target. Uh, what I'd like to do in the next few slides is step through uh, each of those phases and give you some of the key uh, objectives and results that we hope to gain from, from there. But before I do that, I'd like to take this, um, this, uh, this schematic here of the framework and lay it out a slightly different way. Um, each of those three phases uh, contain four elements, if you will. Uh, some pre-work, uh, followed by a technical interchange meeting. So a highlight of each of the three phases is a technical interchange meeting where all of the partners get together and actually have a dialogue, understand uh, what is it? What is it play? What the current activities are within the various agencies within the s and enterprise? Um, followed by analysis that our team does and at the TIM we actually our net facilitation and analysis team facilitates the TIMs collects that data and then we also step through the analysis with the host of deliverables at the end of each phase and so uh, as you can see with the two stars located that shows where we are as a team uh, in terms of phase two, many of the partners, many of the folks in the room are aware that uh, we have uh, published three space papers uh, describing our activities at the end of the second phase. Uh, we're also working on a government-only report uh, summarizing uh, the, the activities and the things we've done so, thus far. So that's the, the star that you see towards the end of the second phase. Uh, for the third phase, we are literally here, right? So we are here. Uh, what we're calling the third TIM is actually this industry open forum where we look to have the dialogue and exchange between our government agencies as well as uh, the commercial attendees, commercial attendees that have uh, graced us with your presence. And so we hope to have that fruitful dialogue uh, this afternoon with you. So for the first phase, again, for these slides here, I'll just focus on the 10 and then the deliverables just to dive, deep dive in those a little bit more. Uh, for, the sec for the first 10, uh, which was our first get together, if you will. Uh, we talked about broadly current investments, uh, some general synergies and opportunities, uh, some of the things that Roberto shared earlier about uh, the four concepts, some of those things were brought, brought up, the, the DARPA engagement in in-space assembly, those things in servicing, those things were brought up, uh, uh, inclusive applications across the government. Uh, and that Tim was held at NASA Goddard uh, over a year ago. And the products or deliverables that came out of that first phase included the value proposition that I showed, the framework, our dictionary, uh, agreed terms for in-space assembly, uh, and, some, and our stakeholder goals and design drivers that I will describe uh, briefly uh, in, later on in this, in, in this presentation. Uh, all of those things were, uh, were documented in a government report. And that points to, uh, again, some of the key results. Uh, the objectives we had for phase one are just briefly described there in the bullets. Um, we conducted the TIM in terms of our key results. We strategize on those activities. We categorize capabilities, some of which I'll actually show you again later in the talk. Uh, as another key result, we integrated the data from the TIM into the document as I described the government report there. Um, and uh, decided on some of the nomenclature as well. I think the key component is when you're considering various agencies, they call different things, they mean different things by the same words. So uh, we had to have some understanding, at least some agreement as best we could on what those terms mean. Um, uh, you know, and given some latitude, but at least that we communicate clearly across uh, the agencies. So for our, our second phase, um, we had a TIM, again, uh, a little over a year ago as well, uh, held at the uh, U.S. Naval Research Lab. Uh, they were gracious hosts to us and our team and all of our S&T partnership participants uh, there. We uh, discuss the capability needs that I'll, I'll show again. Uh, wait for it. I'll show in just a few minutes. 
Uh, we discuss joint priorities, uh, agency capability roadmaps, as well as, once again, uh, some discussion of the uh, in-space assembly demonstration concepts. Uh, deliverables from the phase two included an integrated analysis of past several analytical thrusts that our team saw as we ingressed the data, um, and uh, partnership recommendations, public papers, as well as a, a another uh, government-only report that we're in the process of writing right now. Coming your way shortly. Uh, so again, shown in a different way, uh, objectives there, collecting and prioritized data were really the, the thrust of the second phase. And I'm speaking here from the second phase. I didn't mention earlier, the second phase primarily focused on the government landscape of activities. Um, whereas our third phase, as I'll show in, just a, uh, in the next slide, focuses on now engaging the commercial sector and understanding how we can bridge those, those gaps and activities. Uh, so for key results, our data analysis, and you will hear about this uh, in the next two presentations, our data analysis fell within uh, four thrusts, if you will. Um, uh, Synergies and gaps analysis, understanding some of the, the, the common activities or common capabilities uh, that each agency is working towards and where some things might be missing that we weren't aware of until we had communicated in a, in a, in a, um, uh, in a, you know, a group environment. Uh, prioritization of the capabilities and what we mean by that is based upon the information we received, we saw that certain capability needs seem to bubble to the top and there will be some discussion about that later as well. Uh, understanding certain demo platforms. What we mean by that, definition-wise, those are the uh, technical uh, technology demonstration missions. Uh, you've heard of at RSGS and Restorial. Those would be uh, what we categorize as a demo platform. Uh, and then finally, roadmap analysis. Understanding where uh, the various activities which, within the realm of in-space activity are occurring uh, across the various agencies. And as I said, um, uh, this we presented and uh, we published and presented at AIW Space just a few months ago. Um, those are actually available on the OCT website, so everyone here can actually pull those down and read those uh, if you like. And um, again, another deliverable will be um, uh, the recommendations included in a government only report. So here we are for phase three here today uh, for the industry open forum. Uh, as Erica has shared and as you have seen in the program, uh, this TIM, which we're calling the Industry Open Forum, uh, will include in interagency presentations right, that we're hearing this morning. Uh, in the afternoon, we're going to have uh, commercial interagency panel sessions where then we'll get the opportunity to hear from the commercial uh, agencies in, uh, entities and what they're doing. Uh, as you registered for the Industry Open Forum, you probably also saw on the website uh, our, our request for completion of the online market research questionnaire. So that data will also be helpful in understanding uh, the, the landscape of commercial investments in in-space assembly. Uh, there's a possibility of follow-up questionnaires and virtual sessions based on the data we see to make sure we have as complete of a data set as possible in understanding the, the commercial realm in in-space assembly. The deliverables from that will include, uh, as I shared before for phase two, we analyze government data. So now with the commercial information, there's an understanding of how the commercial information may be linked or may uh, help us better understand some of the government information we've received, uh, which will be inclusive of some recommendations for public-private public partnerships, uh, as well as public papers that we plan to present and uh, culminating in the government report. Oops, I went too far. So for the last few minutes I have here, I just want to touch on a few key components that will set the stage for the data analysis uh, presentations that you will hear following me. Um, so the first component is the stakeholder, the first few components are the stakeholder goals and design drivers. Uh, the way we differentiate here, the stakeholder goals, again, remember the stakeholders are the partnership and the nation. Uh, those were gathered at the first 10, uh, agreed upon, kind of voted upon, ranked, and so those are the long-term performance targets for in-space assembly. And as you can see, we have about four that uh, we listed here from supporting a near-term demo, which is a nod to what Roberta's been uh, spoke, spoke about earlier, lowering the cost, transitioning in the industry, again, which I think is key with the presence of the, the company's uh, the industry here. Uh, our design drivers, uh, 
uh, we like to think about as those concept applications to achieve a concept goal. So things such as stability, assembly itself, uh, upgradability, scalability, as well as interfaces, which can span from mechanical interfaces, communication interfaces, as well as um, uh, other considerations of making sure those interfaces are secure, uh, cooperative as well, or external. So in addition to the stakeholder goals and design drivers, uh, the needs for specific in-space assembly capabilities are also key components uh, of the strategic framework, and they form the basis for the analysis of our team. So shown here are over 40 capability needs um, that were uh, discussed, uh, iterated upon uh, through several uh, virtual as well as uh, a few face-to-face -face meetings um, that describe where these government agencies involved see themselves uh, having needs for in-space assembly capabilities. Uh, we took it another step to roll those up, uh, excuse me, to roll those up into 14 broader capability areas that you see there. And what I like to emphasize on this slide is that this is not an exhaustive list, yet there were, these were considered as the common foundation based on that dialogue and those exchanges. Um, and there was agreement upon, not shown here, but there was some agreement upon the definitions and descriptions associated with each of these capability areas. So I'd like to conclude by just going back to emphasize that there were uh, three high-level goals really from our facilitation and analysis team's uh, perspective for the in-space assembly, the interagency ST partnership forums uh, engagement in in-space assembly. Uh, we coordinated and facilitated the partner dialogue. We collected data and performed data analysis. And, uh, you know, last but not least, um, we were involved, heavily involved in, in, uh, in relationship with the partners with assembling those data products into useful recommendations that decision makers potentially can use. Um, those stakeholder goals, design drivers, and capability needs uh, form that key basis of the analysis. And, the, that analysis will actually be presented in just a few minutes by two others on our team. Uh, Dale Arney will be presenting next, as well as Sharon Jeffries. Um, and as Harley mentioned earlier, I, I really like the way he presented this, that uh, the technology capability investments need to be prioritized and coordinated strategically. And I think that's the overarching theme to what, uh, what we're doing here within the partnership uh, facilitated by our team. So uh, I'd just like to mention the smile faces that you see here. Uh, I think that picture may have been shown once earlier, but those are the participants from the second TIM uh, that was held at the NRL. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude with just showing you the three space papers that we published. Uh, if you want to, again, pull those down, they're, they're also on the website. And lastly, ask if there are any questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philip. Doctor, excuse me, Dr. Dale Arney is next from our s and in Space Assembly Facilitation and Analysis Team. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dale Arney, and I'm here to present the, uh, the, the data analysis that we did uh, on all the data that we collected from the various partners. I just want to point out the, uh, the team that worked on all this analysis, even though I'm up here talking, a lot of people uh, put effort into uh, collecting this data, cleaning it, synthesizing it, and, and creating uh, the products that you'll see here in just a second. So our, our data analysis kind of uh, had, had three major uh, parts to it, steps to it. Uh, the first is the, the data inputs, collecting all the data from the various partners. And, uh, and synthesizing that data together. Then there's the analysis where we uh, take that data and, and try and understand and, and uh, get some insights from, from what everyone is saying. And then finally, the decision support where we uh, go back to the partnership and, and kind of present recommendations or, or how, to, how to work through things. 
Uh, so kind of stepping through each one of these a little more detail. So the data uh, inputs that we collected, uh, we, we, we collected information on the in-space assembly activities that all the different uh, partners were doing. These were technology development activities on the ground, uh, you know, low-level uh, technologies that are, that are being advanced. Technology demonstration missions, both uh, planned or, uh, or kind of in the works. And then finally, the operational missions, the, the missions that those agencies uh, want, to, want to put out there into operation that actually uh, need or, or will utilize the in-space assembly capabilities that, uh, that we've listed. Uh, then the various capabilities, uh, information on each one of those. The, Philip showed you the, the, the list of them. Um, uh, so for each capability, we have uh, which operational missions those are relevant to either enabling, supporting, or, or not applicable. The, the agency needs, so if, if a given agency needs that capability, we identify that. And then finally, where the agencies are investing. So if, if, uh, if an agency is working on a capability, we collected that information as well so that we know, uh, you know where it's needed and who's, who's working on it. And then finally, uh, as Philip mentioned, the, the stakeholder goals and design drivers to understand what the, the joint priorities are for the, the partnership as a whole. So we took that information and created basically four main uh, uh, data products out of that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first two, and then Sharon's going to come up and talk about the second two. So I'm going to talk about the, the capability roadmaps, so kind of the temporal aspect of who's working on what and when, and then uh, the various uh, analysis uh, uh, representations to show uh, how the different capabilities kind of interact with each other and with the agency. So look at Venn diagrams of, of where they're needed, bubble charts, uh, scorecards for each individual capability, and then try and find where there are synergies and where there are gaps that, uh, that we need to address. And then finally, these data products, you know, by themselves, uh, don't, don't do much. They go back to the partnership and we actually, uh, you know, provide recommendations and help them, uh, you know, create decisions on how they're going to proceed uh, in this in this in-space assembly area, you know, how they're going to cooperate, uh, who they're going to cooperate with, and, and so on. So the data collection, we, we collected uh, several pieces of information and stored them in a uh, relational database. Uh, so that we could uh, kind of map everything together and, and sort and query uh, in different ways. Uh, so we had the partners uh, that participated, all the different capabilities that uh, Philip identified, and then three types of, uh, of uh, activities or, or events. And there's the concepts. Uh, so these are the operational missions that I mentioned. Each agency uh, gave us you know, what missions they wanted to, to put out there that needed in-space assembly capabilities. The technology demonstration missions, these are the ones that would actually demonstrate those capabilities on orbit or in a relevant environment. And then finally, the technology development activities that were going on within each agency uh, to advance those capabilities. And of course, there are mappings across uh, you know, all of these, the, the capabilities, support, technology demonstration missions, which lead to uh, operational missions, and so on and so forth. And so the, the goal of our, of our data analysis was to understand what the current state of play was for in-space assembly within the government and to find where there are synergies and gaps within those partnership agencies that we could uh, recommend, uh, you know, collaboration. Uh, the data collection was very iterative, so Philip uh, kind of had his, his phases up there. You know, we had the TIM and we got all the data, uh, but really <clears throat> once we got that, it was, it was you know, a, almost a year probably of going back and forth with the agencies to help help us understand better what, uh, what those uh, pieces of information were, make sure that they were consistent across all the different partners uh, and everything. And so uh, that, was a, that was a long process to make sure that we had uh, good quality data from all the partners that we were, we were interfacing with. And then <clears throat> the data analysis uh, kind of streams went in two different directions from there. They're uh, looking at the, the needs for the agencies for their operational missions. And then they're looking at what are the activities that are going on, uh, both the technology demonstration missions and the uh, technology development activities. Uh, and so we kind of looked at those in, in two different ways. And so I'm going to first start with uh, discussing the needs part. Uh, so if you think about 
um, the, the agency, we have say three agencies, and there's a capability that is needed by, uh, you know, one agency. We'll put it in, you know, say it's only needed by agency one. If it's, you know, goes in the Venn diagram, it's in, it's in section A. If there's a capability that's needed by all three agencies, that would go in section G. You know how, you know how Venn diagrams work. <clears throat> and so we did this for both the agency needs, so what those agencies uh, needed for their operational missions, as well as what they were investing in, what technology development activities or planned TDMs they were actually putting in there. And so we, we um, collected all this, all this information and, and it's all kind of overlapped. You know, multiple agencies need the same thing or are working on the same thing. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to represent that in a way where we could uh, show where there are synergies and gaps. And so what we came up with is a, a bubble chart. And so along the x-axis we have the, the partnership investment. And so we have, um, if, if none of the agencies are investing in it, we have uh, no investment, uh, you know, three ends, right? We have three agencies. Uh, and then our investment was identified kind of qualitatively as uh, high, medium, or none. Um, if only one agency was investing in it, it's in the single agency investment area. If two agencies, dual agency investment, or if all three are investing in it at some level, it's in the, the common investments among the agencies section. Likewise, for the partnership need, if an agency identified an operational mission that needed uh, that capability, <clears throat> uh, if, if only one, then it went in unilateral need, then we have bilateral need and cross-cutting needs. So we have these, these three different areas that kind of define how the, um, uh, the different agencies need that information. And so when we look at our, our Venn diagram, uh, you know, all the things that are only needed by one agency, but none of the others go into unilateral. Then in the two goes the bilateral, and three goes the cross-cutting. And so you get this final uh, bubble chart, and what each bubble is is a collection of the uh, capabilities that are in that intersection. Um, so, for instance, here <coughs> uh, in this in this highlighted one, we have. Uh, two capabilities that are needed by all three agencies and that are invested by all three agencies, one being high and two being of medium investment. So that's kind of how you read this bubble chart. And so you kind of can, can go through here. And so each one of these bubbles represents uh, a capability or set of capabilities that are, are needed by multiple agencies, invested by multiple agencies, and you can kind of see um, kind of in a zoomed out and in aggregate uh, how those capabilities fall. If we want to look at specific uh, capabilities, so for instance, if we want to see what are those two capabilities that those, um, those all three agencies need that have an enabling need and, uh, and all three are investing in, then we go to what we, have, what we call the scorecards. And so each capability has a scorecard which identifies uh, how it's needed across the three agencies and how those three agencies are investing in it. So you can see here on the left, uh, you know, agency one is uh, a significant amount of funding in this capability area. The other two are uh, funding it less so. The dark blue shows the mission, the operational missions that are enabling needs um, for this capability. So agency one has one operational mission and this capability is enabling for that operational mission. Agency two has four operational missions. Uh, one, is, one mission uh, has an enabling need for this capability. One, this capability could support it, it could improve it. And then the other two uh, don't need that particular capability that we're discussing, and so on and so forth. And so, we, so for each of those capabilities, each of those uh, 46 capabilities or, or, or so, um, we have one of these scorecards that kind of uh, goes into, into more detail on um, what agencies need that capability, what agencies are actually funding it, and so we can, and we can look at um, all of those in a, in a given set. What we can also do is going back to the bubble chart, we can kind of group these, uh, these bubbles into different areas. And so what you can see here is in the top right, we have uh, the green area, which we call the potential for collaboration. So this is where multiple agencies need this, multiple agencies are working on this, and so those agencies could uh, get together and collaborate in, in some way. You know, we'll let them 
kind of uh, figure out what the best way to do that is uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of capabilities in this, in this area where uh, multiple people need it and multiple people are working on it and so they can collaborate. And if you look in the high potential for collaboration, that's where all the agencies need it and all of the agencies are funding it. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of potential for kind of all three agencies that we collected data from to, to work together in those areas. You can also see we have areas where there are gaps, where uh, more than one agency needs a given capability or, or would be um, uh, supported by, the, uh, by a capability, but no one or only one agency is, is funding it. And so that's where we could uh, either, you know, we, we've identified these, these gaps and that's something that could be filled uh, with the commercial area, that could be, uh, you know, something that, that people start up new. Uh, there's a lot of different areas that we could, uh, we could address these gaps. Uh, and then there's a, a couple down here at the bottom where, you know, maybe only one agency needs it. Uh, they're not funding it or, or maybe uh, they are at a low level or they're, they're working with a, a partner or something like that. Um, uh, but, but I think where we, we, we really focused on was the areas for collaboration and then the areas for where there were gaps where there's not a, not a, I don't know, I don't want to say not enough funding, but there's not enough investment, there's not a comparable investment to, to the, the number of agencies that need it. Uh, okay, so the, the next kind of uh, analysis that we did were the, the roadmaps. And the purpose for the roadmap was to look at what the current landscape is of in-space assembly is across the government. And once we get the, the commercial data, we can uh, see how we can kind of incorporate all that, uh, all that together with what we have for the government agencies as well. Um, and, and what goes into these roadmaps are the technology development activities that each of the government agencies are working on, as well as the technology demonstration missions that are uh, either underway or planned uh, for the future. And all of those are, are kind of uh, integrated together into a, a common roadmap. And what you can do with these roadmaps is you can um, uh, you can look at them and then pose questions after you after you see it. You know, are these technology development activities sufficient to develop the capabilities that we need for those uh, future operational missions? Or if you see uh, uh, kind of multiple activities in the same area going on, uh, you can say, can these can these agencies collaborate on those activities to provide more value to the to the um, the government? in their capability development. And so the, the, actual, the actual roadmap that we distribute to the, uh, to the partners is uh, interactive and, and, and everything, but uh, that's not really conducive to uh, PowerPoint. So I put together this kind of uh, schematic on, on what the roadmaps contain and, and, and uh, how we can look at them in different ways. Uh, and so like I, like I mentioned, they have both the technology demonstration missions uh, along the top and then for a given capability area uh, of the, one of those 14 areas that, uh, that Philip mentioned, we've identified all the different technology development activities that are going on. And uh, you can see here they're color coded by uh, what partner is working on them. Uh, we, can, we also have the technology demonstration missions color coded by the, the partner and everything as well. Um, <clears throat> we can you see here it's sorted by capability area name, but you can also sort it by uh, a bunch of other different fields that are in that relational database that we collected. So you can look at, uh, if I just want to look at capabilities that are supporting a given technology development mission or that a given partner is working on, or uh, you'll see Sharon's um, uh, talk in just a minute that talks about the prioritization score. Uh, so if you want to sort by prioritization score and that kind of thing, you can uh, you can kind of slice and dice these roadmaps in a lot of different ways, depending on uh, you know what question you're asking uh, as a result. And within each of these uh, these bars, you know, the, right now it just looks like an activity that goes on, but there's a lot of data underneath those as well. Uh, you know what it is, who's working on it, uh, when their their milestones are, or anything like that, uh, who they're collaborating with, all that kind of stuff uh, is embedded in those those different activities. Uh, and so that information is also accessible in, in the roadmaps. So uh, to kind of finish up, uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of 
look at the looking at the capabilities in aggregate and what we saw uh, and what might be interesting uh, for the the kind of community in general is that most of the capabilities are in that area where there's opportunities for collaboration. So uh, most of the capabilities that we identified have uh, kind of cross-cutting multiple needs uh, across multiple missions that we can really uh, work together uh, in. Uh, there are a lot of exciting activities going on now, both uh, TDMs and uh, technology development activities that um, that we're kind of we're kind of the, the time is right to, to really uh, do this kind of activity and, and see how we can kind of kickstart this capability and, and actually start implementing it. Uh, and the, the data and visualizations that we created uh, will be useful in making our recommendations to the s and Partnership Forum, but uh, we also think it's, it's been useful, uh, you know, not only in presenting to you, but in kind of formulating what we wanted to uh, talk to the, the industry partners about uh, it's been very helpful in, um, in, in kind of coming up with that, uh, that set of questions and set of uh, goals. Uh, and then hopefully this can influence how uh, the, the different government agencies and, and our partners uh, implement in-space assembly and develop those capabilities going forward. Uh, so with that, I will uh, take any questions that, that you may have. Mm -hmm. Hear me now? Okay. Yes. So in-space assembly, manufacturing, servicing is not a uh, if, but a when, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and by the way, I'm Andy Quas, a tech fellow from Northrop Grumman. Um, a lot of the James Webb Space Telescope class uh, designs that we're working on right now mm -hmm. are still uh, working with the assumption that we have to do some origami or some kind of unfolding of something along the lines of James Webb. And, and we're trying to look ahead, and this is the first, and reason I bring it up now is the first time I've actually seen a road map that showed a date <laughs> of when this will be potentially operational. And so we're struggling right now with trying to decide uh, at what point do we transition to the ability to be able to take segments up and, and, and put them together in space. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, as you know, particularly for large companies, there's a working backwards, you know, it takes us several years to get to that point of actually flying it. Yep. So at some point, we're looking backwards, we have to say, okay, in 2020, we will start designing for the ability to manufacture it in space or assemble it in space. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a, it's not an answer here. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that it's complex for us to predict that and, and actually designed for that and not meet a deadline because I did plan for it and in actuality I can't because it's not ready in 2028. Right. See what I mean? So yep. just a point of information for you. And I, and I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, Keith or Harley mentioned uh, earlier was that you have to design these systems to be assembled in space. You can't just take a, uh, something off the shelf and, and say I'm going to take this apart and launch it separately. You, you have to start at the beginning and, and make a conscious effort to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna assemble this in space. But yeah, I don't know, I don't know what the date is that, that you should start. I mean, I would say, you know, it's past. <laughs> well, that's my opinion. Thank you. Our last presentation from our facilitation and analysis team, Sharon Jeff Jeffries.
Good morning. My name is Sharon Jeffries. As uh, Philip and Dale mentioned, I was also a member of the facilitation and analysis team, um, working with a team that looked at capability prioritization and also demonstration um, platform analysis to how it could be applied to other demonstrations of um, the capabilities we need to demonstrate. Um, the team that we were working with is listed on this slide, including several of us um, from NASA, in addition to some colleagues from um, Bright Space and Technology who primarily led up the capability prioritization work. What we have on this chart is just an overview of a lot of information you've already heard today from Philip and Dale. It's how the facilitation and analysis team was working to take um, the different topic areas and efforts that are work, um, being, take, uh, being worked on by the different partners and how we could find ways to more efficiently work on them together to meet our um, combined goals. Um, and as we took the facilitation and analysis team, took all of this data, um, as Dale described in his presentation, to find um, how the different efforts work into the value proposition, where we can find those areas to facilitate decision makers as they go forward, um, looking at how we can work those partnerships and get the best uh, benefit as we, as we work forward um, to meet our different mission objectives. More specifically for the work that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, uh, we had two primary objectives uh, with trying to assess how well uh, the various platforms that are considered by the different agencies, what are the technology demonstration missions, how those platforms could support other uh, demonstration needs to meet those prioritized capability needs uh, that have been identified. So for the capability needs prioritization, it's taking a look at that list of 40-some capabilities that were identified through the TIMS um, by the partners and using a set of criteria to rank them so that we can see which are some of the more important capabilities that we might need to address. And then taking those priorities, uh, those prioritized capabilities, um, in conjunction with the demonstration platforms that are identified through the TDMs and trying to do some assessment of how those um, different platforms could be used potentially to demonstrate, um, help us demonstrate those high priority capabilities. So this is a much more complex view of the chart Dale showed. Um, he had the nice organized three categories. This shows a little bit more of the interrelationships of how all of the data we collected at the top fed into the analysis, all of the different analyses that we're talking about, and then feeds down into the decision support. Um, particularly, this topic um, hits the aggregation capability prioritization um, and all of the demonstration platform analysis. So you can see kind of how it works with the data we received and how it feeds in to the decision support um, value proposition. Um, for the capability needs prioritization itself, um, again, uh, we had the capabilities that we uh, were identified by all of the partners. We also had several um, criteria that we wanted to use to help facilitate determining what the priorities, um, the priorities of how those capabilities best fit um, the partner's needs. So what we had is two different sets of prior, um, criteria. One is TIM priorities, which, um, and, and the other is relevance. Um, so the TIM priorities are the stakeholder goals and the tier one design drivers that Philip went over um, in his presentation. We looked at how each capability could support um, those goals and those design drivers. And then we also looked at relevance, which took the um, operational missions which Dale showed we had a correlation of each of the capabilities to um, how many missions that they could be used for and also how, how many of the three organizations had identified that capability as an enabling need. Um, all of these were assessed um, individually across each of the capabilities and then combined into a, uh, and combined into a score um, which helped um, facilitate the prioritization. So with the uh, stakeholder goals, the tier one design drivers, I have a list here, Philip went over them, of what each of these, um, what each of those were. We rated the degree on a scale from one to five of how well each capability um, could address 
or support each of the criteria. Um, it went from it could support it very well to it wouldn't really be applicable at all, and then if it or it wouldn't support it very well, and then if we had any capability that didn't address either the goals or the drivers, it was rated with a null. Um, then we took those scores, averaged across, um, so each of those uh, seven or eight uh, goals and drivers received an individual score, and then for the capability, we averaged across all of those scores to get a single score um, for the TIM criteria. Then for the relevance, it was a count of the number of missions. There were 13 missions um, for which the capability was rated enabling. So we counted a percentage of the 13. Um, and then for the relevance for the partners, it was a count of how many of the three um, partners it was labeled as um, needed, needed by the organization. These, um, the average and then the percentage and the number got all summed together and then they were normalized into a, into a percental uh, rank uh, from a zero to one value. So the highest, the highest ranking capability would get a one and then all of the uh, remaining capabilities got ranked um, by their percental um, below that. This chart here shows the top 20 capabilities that came out of the prioritization um, with their score. We actually ranked all of them and they're ca captured in an appendix of the space paper um, and we used all of the capabilities um, in our analysis, we didn't just focus it on the 20, but here shows the top 20 um, capability needs. And one of the interesting things we noted about the top 20 capabilities is that for, for most, all of these capabilities, it's not really a driving need for some future, you know, futuristic technology to be able to address them. Um, it's more at taking existing or nearly ready capabilities and actually getting the demonstration to prove their applicability to the assembly. So they're not like far out there. There are a lot of these, at least to meet the near-term mission needs, are fairly well in reach as long as we can get that demonstration and proving out of, of the capabilities. Um, so for the demonstration platform assessment, um, it actually relied heavily on, or one of the factors we used was the prioritization, but then we also took a look at um, each of the capability uh, technology demonstration platforms that were provided by each of the agencies, looking at capabilities, their characteristics, strengths, and weaknesses. Uh, we developed several figures of merit that allow us to um, perform analysis on how well each of those platforms might do, uh, be able to perform, and then found a methodology that allowed us to do the um, methodology and then found a way to anal analyze the platform in a variety of different ways, um, looking at all of, all of the characteristics or also having several different ways we can filter and parse the data to target specific areas that um, partners might be interested in. Um, for the analysis that we did, uh, we had five platforms that we included. Um, we have the I International Space Station, um, we looked at the Pathfinder article um, for the James Webb Telescope, which is basically the backbone of the James Webb Telescope that was used in testing um, during development. Uh, we, had, we looked at RestoreL and Robotics uh, and RSGS, which have been covered today, so I'm not going to, um, don't need to go into much detail on those. And then the last was Cirrus, um, which is a partnership between um, NASA and Northrop Grumman. And we focused in particular, it's got long reach manipulation and precision placement of um, parts and, and as well as advanced joining techniques. So those were the platforms that we looked at. Um, the beauty of the tool that we've developed to help us do the analysis is we can add in additional platforms as they're identified and, and, and um, use them in the analysis as well. Um, so what we were really trying to get at is can we find a way to put a value on each platform that would help us uh, determine how well it could do the demonstration of the capability needs. So for the capability needs, we start with that priority um, that I talked about previously, and then several payload cost factors, which are additional FOMs that help us um, capture the cost of doing a type of demonstration for that capability. And we have platform value FOMs, which include platform availability, um, will it be there? Will the platform be there when we need it to be there? And can we get access to it? 
and some platform cost factors, which is getting to use that platform itself um, to do the demonstration. All of this um, is also combined with what we called a platform readiness score, which is a measure of how well each demonstration platform is prepared to demonstrate that given capability or if there's going to be some modification needed to enable um, the platform to do a demonstration of a given capability. So to give a little bit more detail on each of those, um, for the capability needs, I mentioned we had the priorities and we had cost FOMs. These included what is the, what is the cost of a demonstration payload, you know, an estimate of the cost. It's not hard numbers. We were, we were using estimates of a, a payload that would demonstrate that given capability. Um, payload certification, how much would it cost to certify that payload to be used on the platforms, it, it kind of a, at a base certification cost, and then um, how much did it cost to launch that payload, and that was kind of an estimate of the mass factor. Um, for the platform value, we have um, platform costs, which how much does it cost to launch the, it's relative based on the orbit of where the platform is. Um, how much does it cost to get the payload to that orbit? And then platform certification is, are there any additional certifications based on the platform above and beyond that basic payload certification cost under the capability needs? So if there's a human rating factor, you know, if, if, you, if you're going to where humans are, there might be some human rating certification costs or other costs, security costs that got factored in. And then... Um, Availability, um, we had three FOMs, programmatic realism. What is the likelihood that the program, will, the TDM, will actually get a go so that it can be um, executed? Time availability in the time frame, will the demonstration uh, platform be in space when we want to do a technology demonstration? And then access to manifest, if the platform is there, um, can we actually get a payload on it and do something with it, or are we going to be in a queue or restricted by um, some other um, factor? And then the platform readiness is, the, is an estimate of the magnitude of costs um, needed to modify the platform to accommodate each demonstration, and again, that's based on each capability. So I know this is a little bit of an eye chart. Uh, but it basically goes through, it gives the definitions as I, as I just walked through for what each of those farms are. And then we took an effort to um, put a score on each of those farms to say, if I was going to say, what is the payload cost? Is, is, is there no cost? Is it a minimal cost? Um, minor, significant, or, or major? Um, some of the other factors um, for the platform. Is it, how likely is it going to be? Is it certain? Is it likely, unlikely, or, um, or um, questionable? Um, all of those were given scores that allowed us to, that, um, for each platform, for each of those FOMs, it gave, we were able to assign a score. Or for each capability, we assigned the score. Um, the values we used for the score can be varied based on um, partner inputs or priorities from each of the agencies to allow us to see what is more important um, for instance, here we have a bias towards we want no or minimal cost, so they would score relatively higher, but then we wanted to kind of show what happens if you penalize major costs. You could also do it in a more linear scale where you say it's just basic across, you know, um, without any bias put into it. So it gives us different ways that we can um, assess the data to see what potential impacts there could be. Um, so we showed in this chart kind of what our representative scores were for basic analysis, and we also ran several sensitivities across these to show the different impacts. And as we're going forward, we're also talking with each of the partners to see if they have a particular set of weights and scores that they would like us to use as well. Um, so how do we mix all this together? Um, we took all of those FOMs and we put them into a QFD. Um, I think a lot of you are familiar with how the QFD works. You have a series of what's and how's um, with weights that then get uh, multiplied across to get a relevant score. Um, for us, um, the what's were the capability needs farms. Um, the, um, and the weights were all of the scores as they got um, normalized across. Uh, for us, the how's were each of the different platforms, so and, and their um, weight was the score on the platform value farms. 
And then the relevance was the multiplication or the combination of those weights multiplied by the readiness, uh, platform readiness. And then all of those were added up at the, um, for each platform to get a um, platform value function at the bottom, which was a basic rating of um, how well the platform was suited to demonstrate the different capabilities. Um, Another thing we were able to do going across was assess for each capability uh, which platform might show an optimal um, opportunity. Oh, whoops, and I have. Oops. So within the tool itself, uh, we have several different ways that the data gets put together. This is how um, we took the capability needs. Um, where's this, the laser one? Yes. So um, in here we have the priority, uh, the payload cost, payload certification cost, and payload launch, mo uh, launch mass cost factors, which all got scored again for each capability. Now the way with the capability needs, this actually gets applied, as you saw with the QFD, they affect each platform um, equally. Then with the platform values, um, again we gave each platform you know, a score based on how well they fit the FOM, you know, again, um, cost is it, a, is it none, minor, significant, or major. Um, in this particular scenario here, we looked at it again with the sensitivities, different scenarios. This is actually one where if we said it's certain availability and the platform was guaranteed to be there, how do the other factors apply? But we could also put in expected, you know, what do we expect, you know, the programmatic and, t and uh, time frame availabilities would be for each platform as well. Again, different ways to look at the data. Um, and get the score. Um, and all of this then gets played into the QFD where these value, values become the weights for, the, for the, the what's and these become for the how's and then it all gets um, scored down at the bottom. Um, one of the other things we've been able to do with the tool is find different ways to visualize the data. Um, and we are still looking at different ways to visualize the data. We can adjust um, based it on how the partners want to see the data. So things like um, platform readiness, how well does each capability have um, meet the ability to um, address the capabilities and we break the capabilities into um, quintiles or quartiles or you know, septiles or however many from two to 10, we can break it up and look at how those divide. Um, we can look at things like if you choose a platform to be the, a primary demonstration platform, how well do each of the other platforms work as a complement, in which case that would be, say your chosen platform has several capabilities that it can address with no or minimal cost. Um, for any of those capabilities where it didn't have no or minimal cost, we would look at what is the next best platform that could meet that those capabilities with no or minimal cost. So then you can start seeing how can we work the different platforms together to get maybe a more efficient um, mix of capability demonstrations. Um, and then also um, just how many capabilities does it, does it meet? Um, how many, what's the relative modification cost, you know, for each of the different platforms? Um, we wanted to have different ways that we could um, look at the data. So we have several different ways that we could filter and parse the data. I mentioned the capability um, priority percentiles. You know, we have all of the capabilities divided. Um, we, can, we can decide how many bins we want to see up to, from two up to 10, and then you can choose to show different uh, percentile bins. Um, you can say, I only want to look at the top three of five quintiles. Um, we can look at we can select the commonality, you know, is it cross-cutting, bilateral or unilateral, is it how many agencies want to see it, and then we can decide if we only want to see what are those cross-cutting um, capabilities. We can just select those and the analysis is only run on those, um, or we can use any combination. Um, another is mission scenario. Uh, what we tried to do is we have all the capabilities in the system, but then we tried to develop scenarios that might allow us to focus on a particular set of capabilities. Like, if I wanted to assemble a comm satellite, what are the capabilities I think are essential for that, or a space telescope, or an assembly, you know, platform, and allowing us to focus those, um, focus the tool looking at only those um, specific sets of, sets of capabilities. 
And then we could also choose which platforms to use in the analysis. If we only wanted to look at two or three, we can select those and the analysis would um, focus just on those. Um, so from the conclusions, again, a lot of what we were doing was the development of the tool to develop the methodology to do the assessment. Um, but through it, we also saw that um, there's, there's value with all of the platforms and we can kind of see how they can work together um, as, as we go forward with our decisions. Um, through the sensitivity analysis, I'm just going to put all these up. Through the sensitivity analysis, um, there's not a lot of, you know, when you start changing the farms or the weights, um, you don't see a lot of drastic changes. So we think our tool is pretty robust to allow us to get a good sense um, of, of how the different platforms will perform. Uh, we did have, as we're going through, some varied assumptions in the analysis that could be affecting the result, especially as we're talking about what are the um, readiness factors. And so we're working with the partners to try to address that. Um, there's a couple different ways you could look at readiness, and we just want to make sure that we have a good common understanding. Um, but the tool is, is providing some useful data. Um, and so we think it's going to be helpful in supporting decisions. And as I mentioned, as we get additional platforms, we can tie those in as well. Um, so we can look at additional platforms as they come along and um, consider them. So there is future work. I mean, this, this, this tool was developed, um, but it's meant to be used going forward. And we need to, again, revisit the assumptions and revise and, and look at different ways we can tailor to look at the analysis and different ways to visualize as well. Um, any questions? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Yes. So the um, uh, SMC Space Missiles uh, System Center is uh, planning an XST, this advanced space-based test bed that, that uh, Dr. Ewart was talking about. And so a lot of the capabilities that you're talking about are going to be instantiated in that platform. And I'm wondering if it's in the planning stages and this kind of analysis would be very helpful as a sales tool to get money so we can, and the support that we need from our uh, leadership to be able to show them that we're in line with the kind of work that you're doing here with all the other platforms that you've described. So what would it take to get going with that kind of analysis? So, so our, well, two things. One, um, we can incorporate it. When we were doing the analysis, we were just learning about the platform itself. And so we decided to stick with these five with the, with the knowledge and understanding. We could add in the advanced space platform um, as we were going forward in the iterations. Also, we're planning to make the tool available to the government partners as part of uh, this. So when we get the um, phase two work um, done, we will have the tool in a, user, in, in a user manual and can help also so you can do some of your own analysis and see how your tool, see, see which capabilities are coming out as priorities, how your platform might best um, be able to, or which ones you might want to target with your platform that have, might have gaps. Um, using all of the analysis together with what Dale showed and, and what we showed here can help you find where those opportunities are. And that's part of what we would like to actually see going forward, you know, as we move from partnership, you know, panel, um, for, you know, forum to execution, all of the partners taking the tools that we've put together in the analysis and using that to find where those best opportunities are and how to best position, you know, your, your demonstrations so that we can find um, ways to get them implemented. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? Think. Not not a question, but um, a thought. So when Alaza and I ran MeWig 8 a week or so ago, it occurred to us that there are maybe two non-traditional teams that we might want to bring in to diversify our analysis because our analysis was done primarily with space geeks. There are some oceaneering guys that we've touched that Alaza thinks might have an applicability. When you do things deep in the ocean, it's not that different in a sense from doing things way out in space. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one area. Second area was uh, dexterous robotic surgery techniques. Those might also be of interest. So including our non-traditional medical colleagues and possibly our oceaneering uh, colleagues might be a good step to diversify our database and uh, maybe look at some of our biases from another perspective. Very interesting observations. I think it's a good idea. Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, Rudra. Very nice talks. Thank you. And the papers that uh, have been published are also very informative. So my question is the following. Um, it's interesting to hear the need for technology demonstrations and uh, the need for you know, rapid testing and so forth. But there are examples in terrestrial applications uh, where we go to a product line without having to test it in C2 necessarily. And NASA has had missions where we've gone to uh, mission scenarios and environments where we haven't done testing. And when you list those uh, uh, you know, technology needs per se, I'm curious whether in your studies you came to a rationale for why in, you know, in situ or in space testing is needed or technology demonstrations are needed and why those can't be brought down in terrestrial facilities or through a lot of uh, uh, different kinds of approaches without having to go to space, given that the threshold of doing a technology mission is fairly expensive. So one of the things that we considered when we were looking at the demonstration, capability demonstration costs, was we did take into consideration what the likelihood of being able to demonstrate that on the ground was. So as far as the tool that I discuss here, you know, we made an effort to try to capture that in the what is the demonstration cost for doing it in space. So if you don't have to do it in space, it could be a none or minimal um, cost. Um, beyond that, um, I think some of those discussions need to occur within the partners as they're looking at the different opportunities um, going forward to see what is the actual demonstration path that is needed for each specific capability. And for some of those, it's going to depend on, you know, some of the, if you look at the capability list, they're still pretty broad. Um, there are a lot of different types of technologies that can address different performance par characteristics in those. And as those are better defined, um, those discussions will really, you, you can really start getting into those discussions of do we really need to demonstrate this in space, in space, is there a path to demonstrate it on the ground? So we're, we haven't done that yet because partly that's part of the forward work of the partnership. I may be able to assist with a specific case. Um, we had done extensive on-ground testing for solar electric propulsion of specific classes of thrusters. Air Force invested in those thrusters. Industry gave us those thrusters on several of our larger vehicles. Uh, we did learn that um, that was insufficient to completely characterize the operational capability of the solar electric propulsion uh, systems. So we have found that gaining the data in space has been crucial for the Air Force to understand the operation of the solar electric propulsion uh, systems. That's only one example. There may be others, but again, we did extensive ground test. We, we put it in the operational environment. It was on the vehicle. The vehicle used them, and we got some unusual results. And I will defer to my AFRL colleagues at Edwards for further information. I can hook you up if you're interested. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> so one of our colleagues that came to our uh, MIWIG 8 uh, a couple weeks ago re recommended that we be able to remove articles that were tested in space and bring them down. So not just do in space um, testing and evaluation, but actually bring it back down to the ground because it, it originally would probably come from the ground, and it has to then be t retested to see um, what the changes were. So I just, I don't know if that's in your capabilities, but I think it might be added. Yeah, I, I can say we did not consider that. Um, that would probably be something that can be factored in. If there is a need to bring it back, there would be the additional cost for getting it back, and then how it's brought back would, you know, be something that would have to be part of the test plan. But we, that's something that we could add that in, you know, as a consideration in the cost. Any other questions? Ben. Hey, Eric, are we ahead? Yeah. We're ahead. Yeah. Um, a quick question first. How did you factor, or what did you put in for launch cost to ISS? 
So when we did the launch costs, we did kind of a relative of if it was Leo or Geo or um, the Polar. So it was in, in it was basically a minimal or a moderate or a um, so that's something that we can all we're also going to be working with the partners to see if we need to adjust how we did that but for right now it's just we did a basic relative minimal uh, one two three essentially okay yeah because ISS is kind of unique and that's a sunk cost that NASA has already committed to regardless of what the payload is right well, and one of the other things we also included in the analysis, we have several different factors with the sensitivities, and one of was ride share. So if you could ride share to the destination, um, regardless of where it was, we called it, we called it a minimal cost. Yeah. And so that kind of puts it on par with ISS. Um, sure. And, Zero and, is less than minimal, but, uh, but I agree. Well, there's always going to be some costs with getting there. But, uh, Potentially. Well, maybe not, not if it's a strict ride share, perhaps not. Or if you're in a payload or something. So Yeah, no, yeah. so I would suggest we, we take a look yeah, at that. Yeah, that's something else we can, you know, we can look at different ways of how we address um, each of those platform uh, farm costs and yeah. the values we put on them. And that's one thing, too, once the partners get the tool, you can also look at that within your own understanding and see how different things might affect it. Right. As far as... Uh wanting to tease out what should be tested in orbit versus what can be tested on the ground and save money. That is something, of course, that every project has to examine carefully, look within themselves to determine if it's worth it. Um, one thing that we've learned doing a lot of experiments on space station with our RM-12 and RM-3, it'll be launching in a, in a month, um, is uh, some things that we thought would be easy in orbit ended up not being, and we changed direction and have chosen to accomplish that task differently on, on future missions. Um, we've also learned things like um, the ability to simulate space is better than we anticipated in certain areas. And so for future experiments, we are not flying things to ISS, um, I think, uh, to your point. Um, so I think that you, you gain a lot of uh, lessons learned when you do it for the first time to realize, gosh, we didn't need to do that. Or I'm sure wish we did that because uh, there was, you know, unforeseen complications uh, that, that, that came about. Um, so I just wanted to mention those two things. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ben. Any other questions? Thank you, Sharon. So now the wrap-up. Uh, we shared with you our in-space assembly activities first from individual agency perspectives and then from an integrative perspective. Our integrated interagency assessment allows us to strategically collaborate, and that's one of our main goals. Now we can make better decisions from an interagency perspective because we have a repository of data, capability data, roadmaps, and assessment tools. The final piece is your commercial sector input. Please complete the market research questionnaire attached to the FedBizOps advertisement of today's event. The questionnaire is due in two weeks. The email address for submittal is listed on the questionnaire. We plan to document and summarize the questionnaire data and then fold it into our government analysis of in-space assembly capabilities. And we want to make sure that your perspective is incorporated. Our s &T team wants to learn more about commercial investments in in-space assembly related systems capability developments, and how these systems and developments relate to the government's in-space assembly capability needs. Your data helps inform our decision-making process and helps inform how we might structure the trade space of government and commercial in-space assembly capability developments. This afternoon, our s and panel will engage in dialogue with 12 commercial teams to discuss your visions for in-space assembly and plans to infuse in-space assembly into your business lines. We will use the data to examine the intersection of commercial and government objectives. We have one slot left for our afternoon one-on-one -on -one dialogue sessions. If you'd like to sign up for this slot, please visit our students at the desk outside of the auditorium when we break for lunch. If you are participating in the one-on-one -on -one sessions this afternoon, please report to the security desk at least 30 minutes prior to your session. You will need to check in and get a visitor badge and using your photo ID to do so. Our students will meet you at the security desk and escort you where you need to go. If you'd like to come
come in early through the security and then network with the other one-on-one -on -one, uh, participants, please feel free to do so, and our students will show you where you need to be. The final three talks you heard this morning, as Philip mentioned, uh, on our analysis are on our OCT website. Please check those out. You can download them for, so that you can read them. And after this event, all of the presentations from today will be placed on the OCT website, along with a recording of today's event. So with that, thank you very much for your participation. We look forward to our afternoon sessions. We look forward to receiving your market research questionnaires. And now we break for lunch. Several options for food across the street on the ground floor, food trucks out here on the curb, also in this building located at the east entrance, which is out the doors and to the right. We'll begin again at 1 o'clock. Thanks a lot for your participation.